an acronym is always a good thing for every uh, departmental program. Um, and uh, the goal of uh, it, the, the pact is to dramatically cut emissions of greenhouse gases. Next slide, Heidi. This is our reminder. We're going to be turning on the recording and it looks like the little red dot is on. So we are now uh, recording this meeting. Um, in addition to recording this meeting, it will be made available online. All the presented material um, is also going to be um, shared online uh, after, after the meeting is over. Um, next slide. All right, so, so how did we get here? Um, some of you, many of you may have joined us for a stakeholder meeting back in March. Um, unfortunately, I didn't even make that stakeholder meeting. I had grand jury duty and uh, there's no getting out of that. So uh, Frank Stice, you may recall, ran that meeting um, and uh, there was a limited focus on on what the department was thinking of doing at the time. Um, but why are we here? Uh, we're establishing a framework uh, for meeting the clean energy goals and it's focused on all energy related sources and that's driven directly out of the 2019 environmental master plan. Um, further direction was given through Executive Order 100, which uh, directed DP to take regulatory actions to reduce uh, carbon dioxide and short-lived climate pollutants uh, uh, across the board. Um, another rulemaking is directing DEP to establish monitoring and reporting data in those cases where the data gathered is not sufficient to make the decisions of where to, to, where to address um, uh, emissions. So there's another uh, sister rule going on uh, focused on record keeping and reporting requirements. Um, initial stakeholdering, as I suggested, uh, happened back in February. Um, the focus was on further reductions from existing stationary sources, um, EGUs, electrical generating units on and non EGUs. I will say we will use a lot of acronyms today. If there's any question about what an acronym is or uh, what we're talking about, by all means, uh, interrupt, uh, raise your hand, put something in the, in the comments section, um, and we'll keep an eye on that. So I'm going to be moderating the rest of the meeting uh, going forward, making sure comments are addressed, making sure those meeting uh, uh, those questions asked in the notes are addressed. So what came out of that stakeholder meeting? Well, the uh, significant comments were received and there was a lot of the department should be doing more. Next slide. OK, so uh, what do we, we we focused on CO2 reductions from existing sources? Um, some of the questions asked at the highest of levels are why so limited? Why existing sources? Why CO2? Why only stationary sources? We should we be looking at mobile? Should we looking at other climate pollutants? Um, and and we went back to the drawing board, um, and we were all set to further stakeholder. COVID happened, uh, furloughs happened, um, and here we are, nearly well. It's about six months later. Uh, we would have liked to have had this much earlier, but um, some things out of our control um, force us to to slow down the pace. So. Um, here we are today and we're based on the feedback we re did receive back in February. We we have a lot more discussion. Um, next slide. So much so that we couldn't fit it into one day. So over the next three weeks, there's three stakeholder meetings based on reducing air emissions from sources in New Jersey. And you'll notice I didn't say stationary sources. So today we're going to be focusing on greenhouse uh, gas performance standards for electrical gen generating units. Um, we did have a discussion uh, about this back in February, but there's going to be more discussion, uh, more ideas, more more uh, uh, food for thought. Uh, carbon intensity standard for fuels um, and Gladys Bukesi, Bupesi, I'm sorry, Gladys Bupesi will be talking about that later. Um, Dave Ohm will be talking about the EGUs um, and the greenhouse gas performance standard for boilers. Um, and Chris Swaljay will be talking about that also later on. On September 10th, um, we're going to be talking about several initiatives uh, as related to mobile. 
Um, and, and by the way, the the invites um, and, and the stakeholder invitations uh, and, and agendas and, and kind of preparation, I believe went out. Um, Peg, if you want to chime in and confirm that, um, uh, I, I, or if they didn't go out, they're about to go out um, for both of those meetings. Um, but on September 10th, it's the uh, California's advanced clean truck rule. Um, how, how do we do something like that in New Jersey, maybe? Um, doing inspections for medium duty uh, vehicles in New Jersey. Right now, they're, they're kind of a loophole um, that doesn't get inspected uh, through our INM program. Um, maybe some trucker trucking contractor initiatives. Um, how, how do we uh, have uh, trucks uh, convert over to cleaner fuels or electric, uh, ideally? September 16th is going to be more of a port focus, um, uh, focused on cargo handling equipment um, and, and ships. Um, and you'll notice as I'm saying all these things, none of this is uh, embedded in, uh, you know, uh, in, in stone. These are all thoughts for discussion. Uh, we're trying to figure out what the best direction is, so we really, really do want your, your input. Next slide. So, um, in January, uh, BPU released their uh, 2019 Energy Master Plan. Um, I, I share this graphic just to show you how steep and aggressive a, a decrease in emissions is needed to meet the 2050 goals. Um, so, it, it's going to be, it's going to have to be aggressive. It's going to be a challenge. Um, two of the things you're going to hear throughout the talks today, and it's a common theme probably across all three weeks, all these things are driven off the energy master plan. Um, so we're following the guidance that's being put out by uh, the governor's office, the, uh, the state as a whole. And two, you'll notice all the emissions don't happen in year one, um, and they also don't all happen in 2050. We have to figure out what is the best thing to do at what point in time. So as we discuss these items today, think about, OK, it's not doable today. Is it doable three years from now? Is it possible 10 years from now? Um, is it something that we want to kind of uh, work on and think about timelines? So th those that's an important part of the discussion. One. This is all based on the energy master plan. Uh, there's a link right to it if you want to read it. It is fine reading at its best. Um, uh, and uh, the time frames that that's an important part of the discussions today. Next slide. Next slide, Heidi. Thank you. OK, so today's meeting, as I talked about, um, is going to have three parts. Um, the entire morning session is going to be focused on greenhouse gas emissions from electrical generating units. These are the big uh, boilers. We have uh, two coal plants left in uh, New Jersey that are boiler uh, type operations. These are simple cycle turbines. These are combined cycle turbines, and they are large units that burn a lot of fuel. Uh, one of the things not covered in, in this area is nuclear. Um, no, no emissions, no greenhouse gas emissions from nuclear. Um, Dave Owen, uh, who I'll introduce in a, in a minute or two, is going to be speaking um, uh, for a short time, um, maybe a half an hour, um, and kind of giving an overview of where we are in the state, what we're, what, what are, what we need to get to, and maybe some thoughts and ideas to kick around and, and think about. Um, shortly after lunch, uh, Gladys Bupesi will be doing a presentation on carbon intensity fuel standards, um, pushing down, uh, getting rid of, uh, eliminating, whatever the phrase is you want to use, some of the dirtier, more carbon intensive fuels, and pushing down that very aggressive curve that we talked about. So how do we get and push down that curve? Um, and then boiler electrification. Um, Front and center in the uh, energy master plan um, is is boilers um, and the need to electrify them immediately. So um, obviously this, we won't have a rule place in immediately, but we we should be thinking about that. I noticed there's a comment. Um, okay, 
Uh, Peg, Peg replied, uh, it did go out uh, for the transportation related stakeholdering. So the September 10th stakeholder invites did go out um, and uh, uh, for the, the 10th, the 17th, I don't believe has gone out yet. Um, and Christine Shell also uh, replied and said the same thing. Uh, if you move your cursor away from the toolbar um, uh, up in the top right is kind of where I go. It usually makes the, the bar disappear. So I'm going to open it up uh, real quickly for questions. Does anybody have any questions on the general flow of today's subject and um, where we're going to be going with this? OK, um, I don't see any questions being asked, so we are going to go into the next topic. Um, I introduced Dave Owen, who is the um, uh, one of our chief engineers for uh, power plants um, and power plant related uh, permit actions. Um, and Dave Owen is going to give an overview of um, the EGU thoughts and, and, and how we may address them. Thank you, Dave. Okay. All right. All right. Um, Good morning. My name is Dave Owen, and I am an environmental engineer with the Bureau of Stationary Sources. This is a presentation about a potential rulemaking under our climate change regulatory effort, protecting against climate threats or PACT. Now, if you have any questions, I would ask that you uh, wait until the end of the presentation. We'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Next slide. This potential rulemaking would reduce CO2 emissions by implementing measures to accelerate deployment of re renewable energy resources consistent with strategy two of the energy master plan. Next slide. You know, from the energy master plan, you can see uh, New Jer Jersey's transition to clean energy requires the substantial growth of carbon free generation. Next slide. Ultimately, we want to transition to a scenario where gas generation serves as a backup to renewable generation, providing power, power when wind or solar generation is diminished due to weather or other factors. Next slide. Now, you can see some of these numbers, uh, 32 gigawatts, which is 32,000 megawatts 11 of solar, 11,000 gigawatts of offshore wind, and uh, 9,000 gigawatts of storage. These are big numbers. There's uh, a lot to do to meet the uh, modelers expected demand. OK, next slide. Now, our goals are in this exercise is to establish CO2 emissions, typically in pounds per megawatt hour, for all electric generating units that are powered by fossil fuels. And to use these limits to accelerate deployment of renewable generation by allowing EGUs to allocate new renewable, new, and that's underlined for a reason, renewable electric capacity or generation to those EGUs and to allow EGUs to include that renewable generation when complying with their CO2 emission limits. Next slide. Later in the presentation, we will be inviting discussion on these topics, establishment of appropriate limits, for new and existing EGUs, timing for implementation of those limits for new and existing EGUs, and over time, reducing rates control by 2050. And then the third topic is how we will go about allocating renewable capacity or generation to an EGU. Next slide. Uh, 
Next slide, please. Yeah. First, we need to discuss what we are regulating. An electric generating unit, or an EGU, is a combustion or steam generating source used to generate electricity that delivers all or part of its power to the electric power distribution grid for commercial sale. Combustion sources result in greenhouse gas emissions, primarily carbon dioxide, but also methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, methane and nitrous oxide are generally less than 1% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions on a CO2 equivalent basis. And of course, as Ken mentioned before, nuclear power plants do not produce greenhouse gases, so they would not be subject to the new rule. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Now, some EGUs already have emission limits. They, they would have uh, emission limits in both tons per year of uh, CO2 equivalent. So when we figure out the tons per year, we also include the, the equivalent value of uh, the methane and the nitrous oxide that's emitting. And in a few cases where there's switching equipment, there may also be sulfur hexafluoride. And CO2 emission limits in pounds per megawatt hour if they were initially permitted since 2011 and are subject to the Federal Prevention of Significant Deterioration Requirements, which allows us to uh, include CO2 if uh, they uh, trigger PSD or Prevention of Significant Deterioration for other pollutants. Uh, EGUs that do not meet these criteria do not have greenhouse gas or CO2 emission limits. Next slide. Now, now when we, it, one, one goal of this exercise is to put emission limits on all fossil fueled EGUs. These emission limits would be in pounds per megawatt hour as we're thinking now, and would allow a new renewable output to help uh, achieve the, these limits. Now you look at the formula here, and essentially what we are doing is we're putting the allocated renewable power output in the denominator along with the output of the EGU. And of course, these, these would all be over the same time period, you know, over a year or whatever time period we will be using. Um, we'll be looking at a numerical example in the next two slides, and for the purposes of that example, we will assume the CO2 emission limit is 860 pounds per megawatt hour. The establishment of appropriate limits, timing of implementation, and how to decrease these uh, limits over time will be included in our discussion. Next slide. Say the CO2 emission limit for an EGU with a rated capacity of 400 megawatts is 860 pounds per megawatt hour. And the EGU by itself has a CO2 emission rate of 900 pounds per megawatt hour. Now, if the EGU operates with a 75% capacity factor, the annual CO2 emissions would be, you know, that 0.75 times 400 megawatts times 900 pounds per megawatt hour times 8760 hours per year, or about uh, 2.36 billion pounds per year. The capacity factor is the actual output divided by the potential output. The potential output in this case is 400 megawatts times 8760 hours per year. Uh, next slide. If the EGU has an allocated new solar capacity of 100 megawatts operating with a 15% capacity factor, the resulting CO2 emission rate would be, you know, the CO2 emissions divided by the uh, total output of the EGU, which is that 0.75 times 400 times 8760 hours, plus the output of the, of the solar capacity which would be 0.15 times 100 megawatts 
times 8760 hours per year. And it comes out to be 857 pounds per megawatt hour. So it would be in compliance with the CO2 emission limit of 860 pounds per megawatt hour. It is important to note that when facilities submit their plans for allocating renewable resources to EGUs, they could limit the EGU's capacity factor to balance the EGU's output with the pr proposed renewable output, renewable output in order to meet the limit. This limit would take the form of a permit limit on fuel use or hours of operation for the EGU. If they do not want to take such a limit, they would have to allocate enough renewable energy to cover their full potential output of the EGU. Okay, next slide. Okay, before we open up our discussion, I will run through the discussion slides and then come back to this one to start our discussion. The topic for the first slide is the CO2 emission limits. The questions include what limits are appropriate, should there be different limits for new units, and there sh should there be different limits for peaking units. Next slide. The second topic is timing issues. Questions include how to reduce the CO2 limits over time to achieve 100% carbon neutral power by 2050, and how to apply the, this, these reductions to new EGUs and to existing EGUs. And then the timing for implementation, how much time is required before the new renewable capacity is constructed and operating. Uh, next slide. The, th the third topic is how to allocate renewable generation to an EGU. Could it be, you know, maybe talking about installing new renewable generation at the facility, build new renewable generation elsewhere in New Jersey, become a partner in uh, new renewable generation projects in New Jersey. And then the next slide. And here's some more questions about uh, allocation. You know, how would renewable energy, renewable capacity be allocated to an EGU owner or operator? How would an owner or operator sub-allocate their total allocation to each EGU under control? In other words, if, uh, if, if an owner or operator owns uh, several EGUs and they have their partner in one solar project, how would they uh, divide up the, uh, the uh, renewable generation amongst their EGUs? And uh, the third, third question would be, would renewable capacity be allocated to whole facilities or individual uh, electric generating units? Uh, Heidi, can you go back to slide 13, please? Okay. Now, uh, you know, we can start our discussion, but I can, uh, if anybody has any questions about the uh, slides, I can take them now too. Uh, this is Ken Ratzman, and I apologize. I should have said this up front. Um, as we go through the slides, um, do note that there are page numbers on each and every slide. Um, so if you're thinking of a question and you want to have a question answered uh, on a particular slide, write down the slide number. And again, I apologize. I should have said this up front um, and we can kind of flip back and forth through the slides. Um, so the comments I want to make on, on what Dave said, just keep in mind the EMP did say we're still going to need a certain amount of power plants to be in place, if not all the existing ones, in some way, shape or form, even in 2050. So keep that in mind. Um, and, and where we say this is how it's going to happen, we're regulators and we have a hard time saying this is how it might happen. So uh, just keep in mind everything Dave said is, is up for discussion. There's nothing that's in stone just yet. So I see there's a couple um, hands up uh, first. Uh, Tom Gilbert, you raised your hand first. If you want to just unmute yourself by clicking the microphone, go ahead. OK, great. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, so if I'm understanding this correctly, it sounds like this approach would 
create a um, a need for the EGUs to add new renewable capacity. So I guess the question concern that I have is um, how do you ensure that in addition to that, there is also um, an outcome that reduces emissions at the most polluting facilities. So in the, in the example that you gave, it didn't seem like there was any reduction in emissions from that fossil generating unit. There was simply the addition of new renewable capacity and the emissions from that EGU were the same. And so um, in relation to some of the questions that you asked, what limits are appropriate, it would seem to me that you would need to set limits such that the outcome would be that the most polluting facilities would ultimately shut down or find ways to significantly reduce emissions in addition to adding renewable capacity so that um, we, we get at the, the dual outcomes of both driving new renewable generation, but also actually reducing emissions from or shutting down the most polluting uh, EGUs. Thank you, Tom. Dave, maybe you want to talk about what we did in the first round of stakeholdering uh, as far as putting emission caps uh, and, and sliding caps uh, 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 in that just a very brief discussion on that, Dave. Well, I mean, in the first round, we were talking about basically putting um, emission caps, uh, you know, in terms of pounds per megawatt hour. Uh, you know, say a number like uh, 1,700, which would probably uh, take out a few of the the uh, the higher emitting facilities that we have uh, that might force them to either you know make changes or possibly shut down as as uh, as uh, was being discussed. Um, and. The thing is, too, is that the limits uh, when we if we do the, the these combined limits. Um, you know, in some cases it's it's, you know, it would be. Difficult for certain facilities to meet them if they uh, if they are very high, high emitting. So. So, so Tom, in a nutshell, I think it's a two parter. Um, there's going to be a kind of an absolute standard that has to be met. Um, and then there's going to be a standard that has to be met possibly through some kind of flexibility of uh, renewable installations. So I, I think it is a multi faceted or multi piece discussion we can have on that. But I, but I, th I, I do appreciate the comment. Okay. Um, next commenter uh, was, let me go up to the top. I believe it was Jeff, uh, sorry, D Dave, Dave Pringle. If you want to turn your microphone on. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Um, yeah, two questions. Um, slide eight talks about methane being less of uh, less than 1% of a uh, CO2 equivalent in a typical EGU. Um, my question is, what time horizon is that based on? Because the energy master plan was based on 100 years, but state law has since been strengthened uh, to require 20 year time horizon. And the second um, question I had was, if I'm understanding this presentation quickly, uh, correctly, uh, we're talking about the rate of emissions, not total load. And total load is what matters more, especially given compliance with the Global Warming Response Act. Okay. Um, uh, which which slide was it you wanted to go back to? Is slide eight was that? Slide eight, yeah. Heidi, if you can put slide eight on. Thank you. Okay. Well, when we're talking about um, one percent. Uh, this is really much greater than uh, 1%. So typically, you know, some of our EGUs, some of our new ones that we have the permit limits for have uh, CO2 emissions 
on the order of 2 million tons. So the, the methane is, uh, you know, on the order of maybe three or 400 tons, something like that. It's in the 100 ton range. And of course, the, the, the nitrous oxide is probably in the single digits of ton range. So even when you uh, multiply them out by the, uh, by the, the long-term or short-term uh, time horizon uh, uh, global potential factors, uh, there's still way less than the CO2 emissions that come out of the stack of the uh, EGU. So. so, but was this, are you saying that whether you're looking at a 20 year time horizon or a hundred year time horizon, it's still under 1%? Yeah. Yeah. The, the 2 million is such a much greater number than the uh, methane and nitrous emissions that it's it's going to be well under one percent in either case and, and that's based on the smoke stack not the life cycle so it wouldn't yeah that's based on, right. on the stack okay. we don't like the word smoke stack so and, and am i right that so far we're only talking about the rate of emissions not total load well we would be uh in the rule, we would be talking about the rate of emissions, but when we actually, you know, do permits, we will be looking at the total load. And the total load is generally limited, even in existing EGUs, by a fuel a fuel use limit that we that we have in them, an annual natural gas usage limit, usually. Right. I'm not talking about the total load for any individual source, but the cumulative load for the state because that's what we're going after here, right? 80% reductions from uh, you know, under the Global Warming Response Act. Yeah, I, I, I think I understand the question. Um, yeah, I, that that's you're, you're getting into uh, almost a mini Reggie type program for New Jersey. Um, and uh, I, I, I hear you and um, that is something you know, we'd love to hear ideas and thoughts on um, how how would we uh, put a cap on an overall uh, state level for all EGUs and, and all, all emissions for that matter. So um, this is the focus on EGUs and, and having them them address. So um, Frank, I see you have your hand up. I have to defer to you since uh, even though you're cutting in line a couple other people. No, I just I wanted to, to, to address or speak to Dave's point. Um, about total load, mass load, and 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 can you started down the path? I hope you were going to finish. Um, so so in terms of total mass reductions, we are part of the Reggie program, which does call for annual three percent reductions in mass emissions from EGUs. Granted, those emission reductions don't necessarily come from or have to come from New Jersey, but there will be reductions in New Jersey due to the Reggie program. That said, you know the, to keep in mind that as as we transition away from um, fossil to renewable, which this proposal is focused in on, um, any new load, any new load that comes or any new electrical demand is to be offset with preferentially with renewables. And that's what the energy master plan calls. So over time, total mass emissions as part of a comprehensive energy master plan will be reduced. The EGU sector is that sector we have to assure that does not grow. In other words, if we electrify our transportation and our other heating sectors to reduce emissions in those sectors, we have to assure that at the same time we are we are getting our, our energy generation through renewable means. And that's what this the the, the crux of this problem is. It's it's there may be uh, increases in demand for electricity, but we are trying to offset those increases in demand with renewables. So that's just the point um, speaking to Dave's. I hope that answered the question. All right, I'll take that. I will move on to the next. Uh, the next com uh, is a written comment, Dave. Um, does this include cogens that are only for used for facility power and not used to supply power to the grid? Um, again, this is an undefined area, but uh, uh, your thoughts, Dave? Well, I mean, we have that in a uh, in the definition of EGU here. And and uh, that's what we've been using traditionally 
is a combustion or steam generating source used for generating electricity that delivers all or part of its power to the electric power distribution grid. So at this point, you know, if a cogen does deliver power to the grid, it would be potentially subject. But if it's totally inter internal, according to that definition, it wouldn't be. But then again, that's a topic we can discuss. Um, one of the things I didn't say earlier, and I'll, I'll bring it up now, e even if you, uh, 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 you know, you, you react and you're thinking later tonight, oh man, I wish I had thought of this and said something, you can always submit written comments. Uh, so uh, don't feel uh, that today is the only day you're going to be able to speak on this, but we'd love to hear from you today if possible. So Rich, I hope that answered your question. Um, the next person who had their hand up uh, was Nikki Sheets. Uh, go ahead, Nikki, if you want to unmute yourself, just click the microphone. Uh, yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, um, uh, I'm at Tom Edison State University and New Jersey EJ Alliance. And um, the EJ community is really concerned about uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but <clears throat> are also in the context of the coal pollutants that are emitted along with them. And so we've been advocating, this, this is a variation of the first question, we've been advocating that um, those plants that are located in EJ communities or whose emissions significantly impact EJ communities should be forced to reduce their actual emissions. So we would advocate setting limits um, uh, either directly on the coal pollutants or indirectly on the carbon dioxide emissions and you would probably get coal pollutant reductions that would reduce emissions in in you know these communities that probably have near the most um most pollution as uh tom gilbert was saying uh, well he didn't actually in EJ, but you know plants with the most pollution um but the communities have the most pollution and therefore it would it would be good to you know reduce the emissions in those communities with the most pollution um in addition to the plants to put out the most pollution and the communities are more vulnerable so we would really like to talk to you about that. We we submitted comments on that during the Reggie process, and um, you know I've written about that. And have you considered that? Would you consider that? And would you talk to us about that? Um, yeah, uh, Dave, I'll take this one. Uh, Nikki, as you know, there's some legislation that's uh, in the works uh, that that may define some of this for us, um, and may assist us in, uh, to that end. Um, EJ is always a challenging area. Um, while we can certainly have that discussion and we can talk about that um, and, and, and ask, look for more aggressive goals, what I think you'll find, especially in the next two discussions on the mobile side, there's a lot of EJ focus um, with the, uh, I'm sorry, with the next two days with the mobile, mobile uh, sources, there's a lot of EJ focus. Um, uh, for the EGUs, uh, if I hear you correctly, uh, I'll just make up a number. If 800 is a limit, that is for most of the state, if it's an EJ area, you're looking for a 750, say, I'm just, you know, or a 720, a 10% less uh, than, than anywhere else, if I'm hearing you correctly. We're, we're, we're looking for reductions in, 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 in whatever they're admitting now, we're looking for, for, and we haven't specified the reduction, you know, to be, to be bargained and discussed but for reduction in, in their actual emissions, yeah. Okay, you're looking for reduction in actual emissions, not just uh, uh, an offset or something else? Um, not, not as, uh, well, you know, if the offset's in that same community, we can talk about it, but it's not helping Newark if, if those folks in Newark, if it's offsets in camp. So to refocus kind of where, where we are, if, if we were thinking, uh, you know, solar procurement or wind power or whatever it is, um, I'll use Nork as an example, and, and if a power plant were in Nork and, and they they made a deal with the um, what's a, a facility a place up there, uh, the IKEA, um, and, and IKEA is willing to put solar on their roof and uh, and and their parking lot. A power plant in Nork could maybe uh, set something up so there's a huge solar system in in Nork offsetting a Nork power plant. Is it is that what would that be acceptable? You know, we'd have to talk about that. We, we had not actually envisioned that in when we were dealing with, with, with power plants. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we were looking for actual emissions reduction from those from those power plants. Um, but 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 that's why we would you know, you know want to enter in, into discussions with you to go over the details of a proposal like that. 
Now, you know, there, there would be obviously obvious problems with that because how do you define the community and, and all of that? So, you you know, so when you start using offsets, it gets a lot more complicated. Absolutely. But, you know. uh, yeah, offsets, uh, offsets or kind of uh, or mitigation is always a challenge to yeah. to track and, and keep records on. I, 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 I agree, Nikki. So. And what emissions are you offsetting? You know, is, is, it, is it a match? So so, you know, better to get those direct d direct emission reductions. But we'd certainly like to talk to you, you know, talk to you about that. OK. Um, I think the next one was a uh, written comment um, from. Is that, is that a yes to talk? I'm sorry? <laughs> is that a yes to talk? Who was that? I'm not sure who's talking. Uh, this is Nikki speaking again. I just asked my last question. You, you said oh, I'm okay. sorry, Nikki. Go ahead. I thought I thought you were done. I apologize. No, no. You said okay. Is, is that a yes to talk? You know that. that oh, absolutely. That we can all we can all we can always <laughs> talk. And, and I'm curious how the EJ legislation plays out, and 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 what we're going to be looking at there too. So okay. I think all all these things have to be rolled in together and evaluated. Agreed. All right. Thank you. Um. Ken, I, Ken Dolsky, I see you have your hand up, but I'll read your comment first. Uh, your comment says, I think the total greenhouse gas CO2 for methane nationwide, is it about equal to that of CO2? New Jersey should consider its impact on total life cycle by allowing so much gas to continue to be burned. I don't know if you want to add to that, Ken. Um, if you do, go ahead and click your microphone. Uh, thanks very much. Um, no, I didn't, and I think you could take that, you know, along with Matt's comments following mine. Um, so I'll let Matt deal with that. But what I wanted to just comment on quickly was um, this approach that you're talking about of adding uh, renew I don't know, a portion of renewable to each EGU uh, is interesting, uh, but it strikes me as only maybe one tool that uh, would work well in certain situations, but maybe not all. And I think you really need to look at certain uh, other specific specific situations in detail. And let me give you a great example. I read a report recently that talked about the possibility of replacing most of the peaker plant uh, output in New York with storage. Um, and um, I think that that's you know very intriguing. Um, the cost of, uh, of storage is coming down dramatically. There are some new technologies coming out uh, like compressed air and some others that are going to drop the costs uh, dramatically, but only if they're at uh, utility scale. So something like that um, wouldn't necessarily fit fit with this you know, procedure that you're talking about, about adding necessarily uh, you know, renewable energy, but could be something that's very appropriate for fixing the whole problem of having all these dirty peakers. So I would encourage you to look at those things in more detail on a very specific case by case basis and see what could be done. My second comment just in general is we'd love to see a roadmap that looks at, you know, total emissions and each of the approaches that are being used, like, you know, working on EGUs, working on mobile, et cetera, and demonstrate to us that there is a path towards this you know, gross reduction of emissions. Um, what we're seeing is little slices here and there with no way of knowing what the potential is on any of them uh, to really add up to the total reduction that we're looking for. So I know you don't have that now, but that would be really helpful to see how each of these, you know, uh, participates to produce the uh, reductions that we're, that, that we're hoping for. All right, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Um, as far as the storage, it is something we had thought about, and, and you're right, it doesn't fit into our formula or our equation, um, but it is something that New York City has done. Um, I'm curious to see how it gets implemented. I, too, have been watching the prices fall um, and and curious how to see that how that goes. Um, you know, one of the things I'll say, we're going to be doing a rulemaking and, and we're supposed to have it done early next year. I Don't be surprised if there's a rulemaking done early next year and then there's another rulemaking done in two or three years or four years and there's going to be follow up rules. Uh, and as technologies advance and as other uh, opportunities arise, uh, do expect future CO2 rulemaking. 
but I would love for you to spell out your thoughts and your ideas and, and further discussion today on batteries, on how they fit in. I absolutely agree. They could be the piece of the puzzle that could address the dirt, the dirty peakers. They fill in the valleys of uh, of the need. So um, the, it, it, it could be an option. Uh, so I, I do want to hear thoughts on that. I do want to hear, uh, uh, you know, written written uh, comments if, if those want to be submitted also. As far as the roadmap, um, the, the EMP is the overall roadmap, um, and that is part of what we are following and we're feeding into. Um, and the projection on actual reductions and, and what happens is really going to happen during the rulemaking process and all that basis and background. Um, it, it is a very big lift. Um, I know our uh, sister program, CSERP, and I always forget what it stands for, but it's the energy, uh, energy program here in DEP. They work with modelers to do that type of analysis. I know our BPU does models, um, and, and that that is going to help drive uh, the the roadmap, as you called it, uh, for for the path on the and, and and they are gross reductions, big reductions needed. So, um, I, I appreciate both comments, Ken. Uh, Ken, uh, can Heidi just return back to slide thirteen, the discussion first discussion slide? Sure. Yeah. Go back. Okay. Okay. Is there something you wanted to add to that, Dave, or you just wanted to go back? No, to I it? just want to go back to that just to keep the keep ourselves on track with the presentation. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I just read Ken's Matt Smith. Uh, why isn't DP looking at life cycle emissions? Looking only at stack emission gives an unfair advantage to gas power generation because much of greenhouse gas pollution from gas combustion results from upstream emissions. Failing to account for life cycle emissions is tantamount to sweeping dirt under the rug and pretending it is no longer there. So to Matt's point, uh, uh, we understand uh, what he's saying. So Matt, and, and you're, you're free to speak on this too, but I, I make sure I understand the comment correctly. Um, in addition to looking at the methane uh, coming out of a power plant, look at all those drilling, and transportation and conveyance loss emissions and, and account for that and associate it with the power plant. Um, Matt, if you want to unmute yourself, um, make sure I got that correct. And th is that what you're looking for? Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. Um, I just think we, we cannot detach consumption from production, right? The gas doesn't arrive at the power plant by, by magic. It gets there via very certain production and transportation method. And we know what the leakage and emissions rates are from those production and transportation methods. And when we decide to move forward with a particular form of generation, knowing that those emissions, you know, by putting that extra demand for that energy supply, that those emissions will result to not include those in our analysis of which sources of generation are going to give us the, the most overall impact, the most ability to reduce total greenhouse gas emissions and fight the climate crisis. I mean, when the governor uh, came out with his NEG master plan, he recognized that it was New Jersey's acute vulnerable vulnerability to rising sea levels um, and air pollution and, and, and all of these things that result and are compounded by the climate crisis. And so we just we, we cannot detach uh, consumption from production that that is it, it's it's only looking at a, a very small piece of the overall pie, especially when it comes to to methane and, and gas production. So, so Matt, well, some some of the thoughts on that. So, the EMP and the New Jersey emissions, as far as that declining curve or slope that I put up earlier, we can only look at New Jersey emissions from the declining perspective. So, if it's leaking in New Jersey or the methane is released in New Jersey, we can certainly look at that. But we can certainly look at and think about including some of those upstream emissions and avoidances um in some of our cost analysis and some of our uh analysis on impacts um even if the doesn't really help our curve as much as they're suggesting so we can certainly think about that as a secondary uh and it is primary really but it's they're not the emissions don't necessarily happen in new jersey but we can certainly look at that as part of our justification or thought process and why we're doing a rule 
What about looking at the percentage of upstream emissions that result from the 60 plus year old pipelines, interstate transmission lines that run through New Jersey from Delaware <laughs> East? You know, that is not an insignificant percentage of total emissions. And those ones are actually occurring in New Jersey. OK, um, two things. One, if you could share anything you have with us, uh, that would that'd be great. Um, I, I know uh, our, our CSER folks are probably well aware of that. Um, I, and they're doing a lot of quantification uh, work on the pipelines. That is, uh, so I know that's what some of the area where they are working on it. Um, but it can certainly be a part of our discussion in our cost analysis and our impact analysis. That for sure. OK, um, I'm not sure on the order uh, who was first, but I'm going to go to Jeff. You have a question, Jeff Tittle, that is, if you, Jeff, yep. if you want to uh, uh, unmute yourself. Yes, I think I'm unmuted. I don't have a, a I have Apple, so Microsoft doesn't give me a uh, raised hand function, so. OK, you don't have the toolbar either? I have only, no, I only have pieces of it. Uh, oh, I, only okay. I only have mute and unmute. I think it's Apple's way of getting back at, I mean, it's Microsoft's way of getting back at Apple, so I only have okay. comments. So anyway. Oh, um, my either question, way, we can hear you. So yes, so my question is, um, why not develop a plan where we're doing because of you know a title five permitting once we had, you know i mean we've had the ability to set standards for co2 uh and and even methane why don't we develop a plan where we do a series of step downs where we do reductions um basically over a, a, a 10 or 15 year period where we can then um phase out you know, starting with the dirtier plants, like in 2023, um, and then keep stepping down during the Title V permits that basically either require these plants to clean up or replace them by renewables um, until we get down to a point where we only have a few plants left that are the cleanest and most modern plants. Um, this way we could reduce um, the emissions to a level that could get us to the 45% by 2030. That's we need to do based on you know our our climate so you could you know you can step it down by pounds per megawatt hour um you know every th every two to three years because you know these plants permits are on a five-year cycle and so why not do a step of reduction i mean the idea of title five originally was to require step downs so that we could get to attainment on certain issues you know, on certain chemicals why don't we do something similar on co2 so we can get us not only to the reggie goals but to where we actually need to be and 2030 and 2035 and then i have a second question all right so so let me respond uh, uh to that first one one of the specific questions we asked um and i'm glad you brought it up uh jeff is timing on all this w what timing works um what is what is going to be the best timing method we agree uh that the limits should be ratcheted down over time how quickly, how aggressively um, is the is a question. Um, every five years in a permit is one way to do it. Uh, then we'd have to write a rule that says something, and I'm just I'm thinking out loud, something to the effect of this permit gets ratcheted down during renewal uh, by blank amount. Um, and uh, and do we have a separate limit for a combined cycle versus a simple cycle um and you know dave what any of your thoughts you want to add on that okay well why don't we uh go to uh, i think the next slide here that we're, where we're actually talking about these questions heidi heidi slide 14 yeah thank you okay um again you know this is the discussion topic uh how to reduce the CO2 limits over time, uh, you know, applicability to new and existing. And I think the next slide too, uh, let's see. Okay, I guess, okay, just go back. Um, you know, and how much time is, is required. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, that's part of this rule will be, you know, some way of stepping down. We may start start out with a you know fairly high high limit for mm -hmm. pounds per uh, megawatt hour. Then yeah. in say five years, it'll right. be 
it'll be reduced by a certain amount and then in 10 years by another amount. Well, why, why do we want to space it out that far? Um, the, the reason I would, the reason I would do it, I would step it down every uh, couple, every two to three years. You can discuss the timing, but yeah, yeah. I mean, this way you get to it. I just meant because if you do it that way, it could take 40 years, uh, yeah. every five. But if you well, step it, let me just finish my point. If you step it down, um, if you step it down, uh, it, it, it's when those permits then come up. So if each year you, you adopt a schedule that you do a reduction by a certain amount, like from 3,000 pounds per megawatt hour in 2023 to 2,000 in 2025 and 1,200 until you get down to 800 or whatever, um, that would you know set a schedule and then as the permits come up because i know once there's a permit you really can't reopen it i mean i'd like to reopen them but then if you if you sure the standard goes down as soon as those permits come up those plants would then um have to either you know have to meet the standard and, and the point i was going to make getting to nikki's piece when you look at the older and dirtier plants almost all of them except one meaning the newark energy center is a little cleaner than the other ones would be affected right away because you know these older plants um, and the coal plants and that um, tend to be in those overburdened communities. Uh, and then my my last point is for new for new. I think given the latest and best technology, 750 would be about proper. Uh, but we, I think we could do a step down to 800 pounds per megawatt hour and 750 for new, and we can do it and you can you can set it up in a two to three year cycle, and that would get us to 2030 or 2035. To where we kind of need to be okay first of all you know you're addressing the point about doing it at title five renewal we don't actually have to do that we can just write a schedule right in the rule uh, oh i know that but i said yeah i would put the schedule in the rule but i just meant that you know yeah. since you, you're giving out permits now and it's hard to reopen them in the middle you, uh, but that would be one way to re to, to get at them versus now we would put it in a rule we would put the schedule directly in the rule r right now when you adopt it um yeah. And then as permits open up or however you can get to those permits, um, you can then cause the reductions. Yeah. Well, I mean, they would be they would be obligated to do it uh, mm -hmm. with the schedule and the rule, regardless of uh, whether or not they've been re renewed in the meantime or not. No, that's good. So, uh, so. so, uh, so yeah, and timing, you know, I'm just the question about timing is that if we're adding the uh, renew renewable power. How much time does it build, take to build 100 megawatts of uh, solar? Because we're talking about new power that's not buying into existing power plants. Yeah, I understand. And we can, you know, right, right now, New Jersey is also exporting quite a bit of gas power uh, as well. But that's but I think if you look at the ratcheting up of where we are going with the energy master plan, we should be counterbalancing the ratcheting down in greenhouse gases with it. So as renewables, because we're, we're, you know, we're talking about, you know, 1100 megawatts coming on in a couple of years, we're talking about 7500 there. And but if you look at the energy master plan, you know, we're talking quite a bit of solar coming online. And so as one comes as greenhouse as um, renewables go up, greenhouse gases go down, um, you should, you know, the schedule should kind of almost be together. But if we want to get to those reductions we need, we need a more aggressive schedule. Um, the other point I wanted to make um, separately was that adding solar to a dirty power plant does not reduce the emissions at that plant unless you're going to be cutting back the hours it can operate. Otherwise, it's still emitting. It's sort of like we're sort of diluting it, saying we're, we're playing like an accounting game. By adding a 50 megawatts of solar, we're allowed to keep polluting at a certain level. That pollution is still there. It doesn't go away. Well... Um, Heidi, do you want to go back to uh, slide 10? Uh, let's see. Uh, Jeff, uh, Dave, you want, let me let me take a crack at that first. Um, yeah. I, Dave, uh, Jeff, we, we do we agree. Um, there has to be a hard cap on the dirtiest of the power plants. Yeah. And I think that is something we covered at great length in the first stakeholder meeting and and there's going to have to be just an absolute limit that has to be met period on uh the dirtiest of, of power plants and, and and what we highlighted is it would probably affect a couple coal plants and, and five or six of the uh dirtier peaker units as being 
a really challenging limit to meet without significant amount of control in some way. Um, so so that that's that's step one. Um, and and the step two with with the kind of the balancing of the solar is is a two piecer and Dave alluded to it. Um, you know, there's power plants that only run 300 hours a year. Um, there's other power plants that run over 8000 uh, hours a year. Um, and their permit limits, if they wanted to limit their emissions, that we, we would we would insist on uh, if they want a capacity factor to be accounted for, it would have to, at least I think, be an actual permitted limit that says you can't emit over this amount based on this hours of operation. So I, I think both those uh, areas of concern could be addressed um, through that that approach. Yeah. And I just want to point out that with the exception of the coal plants, uh, most of the uh, the uh, power plants with capacity factors over 50 percent are already emitting, uh, you know, less than 900 pounds per megawatt hour right. based on uh, some of the uh, CAMD data that we've looked at. So it's basically the the newer and you know to whatever extent cleaner power plants are the ones that are operating more at this point the the older peakers are less efficient their their fuel costs are higher uh on a per megawatt basis so they only get called upon uh you know when the demand is really high and again as ken was talking about heidi do you want to go to the next slide please uh next slide after that is that you know we would be if 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 an EGU wanted to this this particular EGU wanted to uh, commit itself to installing 100 uh, megawatts of uh, power, then uh, then it would have to uh, basically commit itself to that 75 percent capacity factor either by a limit on hours of operation or a limit on fuel use over the course of a year. So, and of course, you know, the other thing you have to remember is that, you know, the solar capacity factor is, is low because it, you know, it doesn't operate at night and whatever, and it operates at peak when the sun is the highest. So I use that 0.15 in that example, uh, based, on, based on EIA data from 2014 to 2017, it said that New Jersey's solar capacity factor was actually about 16.8%. So, so that example is a little conservative in that regard too. Uh, Heidi, you want to go back to the, uh, I guess, second discussion slide, which would be fourteen. Yeah. Okay. All right, Ken, you're muted if you're talking. Thank you. First time I did that, I think. Jeff, uh, thank, uh, I think we addressed your, your thoughts. Um, if, if you have more ideas, more thoughts you want to share, by all means, uh, yeah. we're, we you know where we're at and you can submit comments uh, yeah. in writing. Um, note anything that's submitted in writing is also going to be shared um, and on, on, in the public forum also. Um, I'm going to mute everybody again, uh, just to make sure. So Dave, if you have to talk, you're going to have to unmute yourself too, but uh, muting all again. Um, OK. Uh, so next next uh, I'd like to actually uh, introduce uh, Mike Russell. He's the uh, I don't I don't know his official title. I call him the state economist. Uh, he wanted to kind of weigh in on the whole upstream uh, discussion of the uh, greenhouse gases in, in pipelines. So uh, Mike, if you want to unmute yourself, uh, go ahead. OK, so I think I'm uh, new to, I think I, I just mainly wanted to uh, you know, ask for clarification or, or ask a question in regards to the, the live stream discussion. Um, if if production and consumption cannot be delinked, then if if our proposal is uh, aimed at reducing consumption, wouldn't that also uh, reduce emissions on the production side that may be happening out of state? So even if we're not explicitly targeting that when that still have the effect that that would, it sounds like we're looking to uh, create from the discussion. I was my only real question there. 
Thanks. Can I go ahead and respond? Oh, great. So, I mean, you're right in saying that there would be some associated reductions at the consumption at the uh, production side by reducing demand. However, this is about re choosing the best energy sources to get the greatest impact, right? It's not just we'll take whatever reductions we can get. We need to be extremely intentional about picking the fuel sources that will provide the greatest emissions reductions. We are in a climate crisis. We have less than a decade to achieve the 45% reductions outlined in the 2018 UN IPCC report that the governor has committed and the, and the legislature have committed the state to achieve by um, upholding our commitments to the Paris Climate Treaty. Um, and, um, and so we cannot afford a, a, a partial look at or or an acceptance of some emissions reductions we must uh drive the greatest emissions reductions and can only do that if we're accounting for um all sources of emissions not just one source of emissions thank you matt um Thank you. So, Mike, Matt, maybe you guys have some future discussions also, but um, I, I, I think we can still certainly evaluate those emissions and those emission reductions in our basis and background. The actual accounting for them on the state reductions may or may not be applicable depending on where that pipeline resides. So that is a definitely food for thought. Um, Toby, you have been uh, holding your hand up for a long time. Uh, you are up. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, my arm was getting tired. <laughs> uh, it's a uh, lot to think about here, Dave and Ken. Thanks, though, for the for the good presentation and, and a lot of thought into this. I guess my, I, had, I had two points to make, but they're you know they're kind of related to that that life cycle question uh, on a different side of of the I guess of the economy of the markets. Uh, and, but the, it, it starts with something related to you know the questions that you have on on slides 13 and 14. Uh, if we're talking about what what limits would be appropriate, I think on the previous slide, Dave, uh, I, I, I have I immediately start thinking maybe like Dave Pringle said earlier, what are we looking at in tons of total reduction, you know, total loading to the atmosphere? Uh, if, if there's a target there that we're shooting for and there kind of needs to be for us to be able to understand the, the benefits, uh, how much reduction will we get? from reducing to different pound per megawatt hour levels. Uh, have, do we do we have a target or, or a, a, a phasing of targets for, for reducing actual tons that, that you would link to this? See, see one of the challenges and, and I, I don't I don't want to put a number out there. Um, and one of the challenges with this and, and Dave alluded to it um, and some of our uh, energy people can certainly uh, support the statement is there, the energy demands in New Jersey, if everything goes the way we want, is going to increase. So the question is, how do we ensure that we minimize uh, emission increases from fuel-fired power plants and we encourage alternative energy as, po as much as possible? Um, you know, there, there's a question out there we haven't gotten to yet of, are we banning new power plants? I don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, there, there is no fuel ban out there right now. Um, it is certainly something we can have a discussion on. But as emissions increase over time, um, I mean, I'm sorry, as demand increases over time, we need to at least hold emissions steady, if not declining. So um, Hannah, uh, uh, I don't know if, if you're on the line from BPU. I believe you are. I don't know if you want to weigh in, in on some of that long-term uh, discussion uh, from uh, BPU perspective. Not not Toby, Hannah, Hannah <laughs> from uh, BPU. I, I don't know if she's on the line or not. Uh, well, Ken, I, you know, I know the, I think roughly the greenhouse gas inventory uh, last year, you did it, had I think somewhere 17, 18 million 
can be associated with EGUs, uh, in-state EGUs. Toby, can you repeat that? You broke up on that one. I'm sorry. I try it without video. Can you hear me better? Give it a go. Can yeah, I was just saying that based on DEP's inventory of in-state greenhouse gas emissions uh, from EGUs, I think the the total inventory points to about uh, 17, 18 million metric tons of CO2e from EGUs. So uh, if we went to zero, that's what we would that would be what we would be getting ultimately, right? From a from a baseline of 2018, I think is the last year you have inventory data for. So, you know, think, thinking about how much of that you would be able to get in chunks and, and relate that to pound per megawatt hour reductions, it's just, you know, the my linear thinking, my analytical thinking is that that's part of your formula. If you haven't pr progressed to that yet, that would be uh, you know, something I think you need to need to be able to show to be able to, you know, to, to demonstrate that we're getting the benefits, the intended benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, that, then, that, would uh, absolutely, that would absolutely be part of any rulemaking. Do I hear Hannah? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. We got Sorry, you. I got myself off mute before. Um, I, you know, I think it's a really good point. I, the only other consideration I would add is that, you know, there we're also looking at emissions from other sources, and part of trying to reduce emissions in aggregate is to reduce emissions from transportation and the building sector as well. And in doing so, will increase demand on electricity, and so. Part of that is the reason for a, a massive new renewable bill so that we're not building new power plants to capture the new load. But um, but I think in, in looking at, at how we might try to reduce aggregate greenhouse gas emissions from the power plants has to be done in consideration of how do you balance out with new demand coming on because you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions from other sectors. Yeah, and, and Hannah, that and Ken, that's kind of where my my second point was going. Was um, yeah, you, you can talk about the other sources within the economy, uh, but then we also have other EGUs outside of New Jersey. You know, we're on the on the PJM grid. Uh, if we if we're successful in reducing emissions in New Jersey, but those but that causes our our our, our New Jersey based generation to become more expensive. Uh, the other the other states in the grid, the other power plants in the grid will pick that up. So we have a leakage issue that we would you know need to again evaluate in the uh, in the overall picture of are we meeting our objectives to reduce total CO2? Uh, we, we might feel good about having standards in New Jersey, performance standards in New Jersey, but if that's just causing uh, that that load to be picked up perhaps by dirtier plants in other states that don't have the same regulation, uh, you know, we, we've got to we've got to consider that carefully as well. And uh, as you know, that leakage question's always been a been a big one with with uh, programs like Reggie. I, I think you're going to have the same the same interplay here too. Yeah, Toby, to respond to the leakage question, it took an hour and a half for that to come up. Uh, well, um, but yeah, leakage we knew would be one of the subjects uh, talked about, and it is something we are concerned about and it is something we evaluate. Um, and I referred to models being run uh, by CSERP and by BPU and, and part of their modeling does address leakage. Um, one of our hopes is uh, Pennsylvania does join Reggie and uh, leakage becomes less of an issue from that perspective. Um, but uh, it, 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 if we have a really tough standard, I understand the leakage concerns and and that is something we would certainly have to evaluate and uh, and and don't discount your uh, you know your ability with uh, interstate diplomacy let's say i know that's a hard thing to do but i know you guys try to do it too so uh that would be another recommendation certainly to to level that playing field okay that, that's all i had thank you okay thank you toby um, I'm going to go back to the comments section. There were some people who had comments. Actually, Bob Kedig, you're going to cut in line. Go ahead. Thanks, Ken. Um, just, yeah, I just wanted to um, respond to and kind of piggyback on, on Toby's comment. Um, first, the question in regards to the uh, absolute reductions based on the current inventory. You know, yeah, we're about um, 18 million metric tons from the electric generating sector in New Jersey. At least that's our 2018 inventory. Um, and that's, you know, roughly with us consuming about 75 million, 76 million megawatt hours. 
Um, where we have to get to moving, moving forward to 2050 is, is a more than doubling of that. It's what the, the EMP projected. So the, the, the um, using this um, rule as a mechanism to um, you know, expedite the deployment of renewables into the grid supply electrogenic market is a, is a step in that in in that direction. That we're not we're not looking at um, how many renewables do we have to deploy to back off 18 million tons. We're looking at how many renewables do we have to employ at meeting our mandate to beat the 80 by 50 reductions and 100% renewable generation by 2050 when we have not 75 million megawatt hours of load, 168 million megawatt hours of load. And to, to Toby's point, you know, New Jersey participating in a regional transmission um, operating electric grid, PGM, um, you know, there, there, uh, there is effects that go beyond our border that relate to the emissions from our consumption of electricity. And, and without recognizing that, um, you know, moving forward, there is unintended consequences of just displacing and shifting the emissions from things we electrify to electric generating out of state. So um, yes, absolutely regional approach, um, absolute reduction from 18, that's today, but we're looking at where we have to get to in 2050. Thanks, Ken. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, sorry, I was remiss. Um, Hannah Thonet, by the way, works at BPU. Many of you probably do know her, um, but she is our liaison on everything EMP um, and has been plugged in on uh, some of these thoughts and processes and ideas. And uh, uh, Bob Kettig is in our sister bureau, uh, Energy and Sustainability. So um, we are all working together to kind of move this in the same direction. Yes, state agencies working together. We can do it. Um, I forget who, uh, Toby, did we answer all your questions or at least address them, maybe not answer them? You know me, I may have more, Ken, but that was it for now. Thank you. We, we have until noon. Keep that in mind. We, we, uh, this, the, as I said, Dave's presentation was short. This is to stimulate discussion. So I'm glad we're having the discussion we're having. Um, Samantha Jones, um, has DEP considered any exemption for the EGUs at critical infrastructure manufacturing facilities that are part of their disaster recovery plans? Samantha, I don't know if you want to speak um, to any of this more or if you just want us to respond. Hello. Um, so just, you know, if, if it's not clear um, with that question, um, that I guess comment came directly from one of our members. And I think I think what they're concerned with or, you know, um, you know what the issue is, if there's any, I guess, potential roadblock in ensuring, you know, their continued operation and security if an outage or, you know, an attack occurred. Um, what I will say, um, we, we haven't really thought about emergency provisions um, or reliability must run provisions, um, things of that nature. Uh, but inherent in every rulemaking is going to be some of those, I don't want to say outs, but some of those acknowledgements that certain things do need to happen. Um, if if someone has an emergency generator, I'm um, just using as an example, um, and there's an emergency, guess what? They can operate it, they can run it. Um, I, we have had a couple power plant applications that are applying as resiliency emergency type operations. Um, so I, these are all thoughts, um, but I, obviously um, we don't want things to shut down. Uh, we don't want the grid to shut down, to black out, to brown out. Um, so we have to work uh, within those constraints. So um, it'll certainly be a consideration. Anything else you wanted to add on that, Samantha? Or Dave, did you want to add any of your thoughts? Well, I mean, yeah, you know, when we get into uh, writing the rule, we we might write provisions in there like maybe exempting uh, CO2 emissions during emergencies from uh, by the EGUs. During uh, the actual, during an, an actual emergency. During an actual emergency, yeah, of, of some sort. 
or some something of that nature. Um, OK, thank you. OK. Um, back to Ken Dolsky. Uh, are you planning to also prohibit the building of totally new gas fired power plants? Um, there is no ban on burning of fossil fuel or, or a ban on new fossil fuel projects. Um, the direction is if, if a new plant meets the standards and meets the rules, even a, rel a very low carb CO2 emission standard, um, it could be built. Um, uh, is it needed? Um, is it necessary? That, that That's two different questions. Um, I don't, I believe at this time, have the authority to do a ban um, uh, on, on new power plants. Um, but I'd love to hear people's thoughts um, and and if they're if they want to have a discussion on this. Ken, I turn it over to you first. Uh, so I'll just quickly note, you know, there are plans right now to add the new New Jersey Transit is going to build a new power plant. It's going to increase greenhouse gas emissions by at least a uh, half a percent, if not more, when you take into account the full life cycle, uh, you know, methane, uh, CO2, you know, CO2 equivalent. And in order to meet the uh, EMP targets, you know, you've got to offset that before you could even begin to get back to uh, where the EMP was, you know, last year. In other words, if they're going to add another, you know, 1% to greenhouse gases, you have to cut, figure out how to cut that and then start cutting from there. You're just digging the hole further by allowing that, that plan to be built. Okay, I, I, I appreciate that comment and uh, I, I, it's not the first I've heard of the uh, NJ Transit grid in, in, in that vein. So we understand where you're coming from. Um, Dave Pringle, if most already under operating under 900 pounds per megawatt hour, then how are we making things better? i.e. reducing emissions as opposed to just not making them worse even after offsetting this is just part of the pie and there'll be greater demand given EVs and other greater electrification. Um, Dave, I think we partially touched on this um, and Hannah and Bobby also touched on this. Um, there is always going to be a need for a certain amount of power plants out there um, uh, in, uh, in the future. Um, the the demand for energy is going to increase um, and we're hoping and we will have to quantify it. We're hoping that by promoting and pushing uh, the renewable energy market, we can fill in that increased capacity needs with renewables. Uh, so that is that is my thought and my answer on that. Um, Hannah or Bob, uh, Bobby, do you want to kind of chime in on that? Or Dave, do you want to add anything before I turn it over to others? Yeah, I, I think you're right that we um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK, uh, I think you're right. We already kind of dis discussed it. So I'd just like to add add a little bit more to it. Um, kind of teeing up a question also already on in the chat from Kandalski. How, how much um, are you? What kind of energy efficiency are you accounting for in all of this? And I know some of this is, you know, recognizing that we're talking about you know, a smoke, I'm sorry, a stack rule um, here, but, um, you know, and, uh, BPU and others are dealing with BPU and also, I, I mean, dealing with the energy master plan, all these other things. So, um, yeah, I know we, we need to drill down on each individual piece, but it's really hard to, you know, how good or not we think this approach is, is directly related to how it fits in with everything else and we're not even seeing that everything else so i think it makes that you know the, the roadmap that ken talked about earlier uh, very critical and um a, as good as the energy master plan is it's still very much a shell um and has yet to be even updated to reflect the new law that uh you need to be looking at 20 year time horizon so rather than repeating you know past things i, I guess i'd like to hear more about you know, the 20 year time horizon um how energy efficiency is playing into all this and how do we move forward seeing how this piece of the puzzle 
fits in with all the other pieces to make sure we get to the reductions that are necessary overall. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, so, you know, and we are talking about EGUs today and, and, and we're talking about what's coming out of the stack at EGUs and, and we can certainly look at the bigger picture on some of these things. Um, part of what we're going to be discussing this afternoon is some of those other types of sources, um, be it smaller fuel burning sources or boilers, uh, which can be small or large. Um, and and then next week, next couple of weeks, we're going, to, we're going to be discussing some of the mobile initiatives and, and how we address those. Every time we touch one of those other things and we we take away one of the what I'll call fuel burning options, it's going to become an electrical substitute and that's going to push or promote more electrical demand. Um, and it, it will absolutely be a challenge to minimize and or reduce uh, the power sector emissions uh, while satisfying that overall demand increase. OK, um, I think we did cover that. Um, Matt, you said I can respond. I don't know if uh, um, if there's something else you wanted to respond to or were you responding to Dave Pringle's comment? He was responding to an earlier question from the economist. OK, thank you. All right, I'm going to mute everybody again. OK, um, let me go back to the dialog box. Um, Mike, you'll follow up with somebody else. That's good to see uh, Matt Smith. We have thousands of miles of gas pipelines in New Jersey, along with dozens of gas compressor stations and other facilities in New Jersey's that need to be included in our inventory. Um, I don't know that I have an, a full blown inventory per. Well, Bobby, maybe you can answer it or, or if you have someone on your staff that can answer some of those inventory type questions about the pipelines and gas compressor stations. You may have to unmute yourself, Bob. Okay, I guess he's. Okay. Oh. Um, okay, maybe um, maybe that was in response to a Mike Russell comment. Um, Matt, as far as the inventory, I'll, I'll just kind of look at it this way: um, the gas compressor stations, from a, an efficiency perspective, uh, we we didn't do a CO2 rule, but we did do a a racked rule or CTG. Uh, uh, a couple years ago on those. So for those that are gas fired uh, turbines, co compressors, that they, they are very efficient. They are still burning fuel. You're absolutely correct. And they're burning a significant amount of fuel. Uh, it, but I don't know if it's significant in the overall inventory. That is not something I can answer. Um, maybe Bobby will answer that. Um, and as far as the pipelines, I think that is part of the, the rulemaking that's being done on uh, collecting more information on other sources. So, um, Matt, I don't know if I answered that question or not. If you want to chime in, I mean, I think many of us are sort of um, articulating this point. So, uh, you know, I, I think we've heard from DEP that it's not in the plans to address this in this rulemaking session. So, um, you know, I, I just. I think that this is again talking about life cycle emissions and it was in direct response to um, Michael's comment, I believe, about, okay. um, you know, not being able to double count. And so this is about at least parsing out New Jersey's uh, emissions from interstate gas transmission and, and processing. OK. Noted. Um, next question is from Kendalski. Uh, how much improvement in energy efficiency are you planning to achieve to reduce load demand? Uh, Hannah, if you're still on the line, that is definitely in the wheelhouse of BPU. Hannah, I don't know if you're muted. Uh, 
You're breaking up, Hannah. Um, Hannah, maybe you want to hang up and try to reconnect. I too have had some challenges from home. I came in the office uh, today because I couldn't 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 uh, handle that one today. So, uh, Ken, I I hope to answer that one uh, through Hannah in a, a couple minutes. Oh, you back, Hannah? All right, I'm going to mute all again. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tom Gilbert, holding emissions steady. Holding emissions steady won't get you to the greenhouse uh, GWRA 2050 targets or 45% reduction needed by 2030 unless you can achieve all the reductions in other sectors. However, this approach doesn't address EJ concerns noted by Dr. Sheets. Yeah, I thought I could elaborate a little bit on that. Um, so I heard it said a couple of times, it sounds like a key assumption you're making is that the goal for the electric sector is to um, keep emissions flat. And, you know, I understand the point and agree that, you know, demand will increase um, for, for the electric sector as we electrify the building and transportation sector. Um, but I think it's, you know, that's a key assumption, it sounds like, and it's really hard to evaluate that without seeing the larger strategy. And I guess this is where the, you know, the GWRA report hopefully we'll speak to this and come out soon, you know, overall, how, you know, how are you going to get to the 2050 targets and interim targets? Um, and can you really get there with um, maintaining level emissions in the electric sector? That I mean, it just seems dubious to me that that's going to be possible. Um, and, and to the timing issues, it seems like you know, reducing emissions in the other sectors, I think, is going to take longer. I mean, it's just, you know, to electrify the building and transportation sectors is is going to take time. I mean, you're talking about the the decisions of, you know, um, millions of individuals, whereas in the electric sector it would seem to me that it's possible to make more progress in reducing emissions in, uh, you know, sooner. Um, and that we should be focused uh, over the next 10 years in not just um, keeping those emissions level, but actually achieving emissions reductions uh, in the electric sector in a way that's also going to bring, you know, benefits to 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 EJ communities. Um, so that's just sort of a bigger. It's kind of the bigger picture. It's really hard to evaluate what you proposed here without understanding that that bigger picture. Um, and if I could just make one more comment on the leakage issue, uh, it seems that the trick there is setting the um, limits and ratcheting those limits down in a way that finds the sweet spot that you're you're reducing emissions or taking offline the most polluting plants, while at least in the near term, leaving those cleanest, cleanest, most modern burning plants operating because um, it would actually be counterproductive in the short run to ratchet down those plants because that's just going to push emissions. It's going to push generation likely out to dirtier, uh, less efficient plants, you know, elsewhere in the region. So it's it's a matter of kind of finding that sweet spot. Tom, Tom let me let me uh, address your second comment first, because uh... I don't want to say it's the easier one, but it's the one that's a little more straightforward to me. Um, the, the concern about being aggressive but not overly aggressive is the challenge. Um, how, how, how do we be aggressive without putting our our businesses in New Jersey at a, a non-competitive advantage where the power just gets imported from something potentially dirtier to our west? Um, and it is what we struggle with on a regular basis of 
in not just the EGU world, but in all the rules that we do. Um, so it, it is it is a challenge across the board. Um, and 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 that sweet spot that, that you talked about may not be aggressive enough for meeting the goal. Um, and and that's where you know we have to we have to figure that out and we have to work with our counterparts um, in BPU and CSERP. Um, and for that matter, we have to work with our counterparts in Pennsylvania and Maryland and Delaware and all those upwind states. Um, and sometimes when I'm saying work with, it means uh, <laughs> sue them. Uh, sometimes it means have uh, discussions with them. So there are a lot of tools in the toolbox to make the playing field level. Um, so so the, that, that's kind of my answer on leakage. Um, as far as keeping the emissions flat and keeping the focus on EG reductions, I get it and, and I and I agree. Uh, even in the 2050 report, uh, th there's statements about um, needing all the existing power sources, even in in, in the uh, uh, late stages, close to 2050. What they see is a feedstock into the natural gas pipeline of renewable feedstock. Um, so instead of maybe reporting uh, uh, natural gas from the West, uh, maybe there are natural gas generation plants from sources throughout New Jersey, from the wastewater treatment plants, from the landfills, from these uh, uh, various sources of generating renewable natural gas and renewable gases. This is this is the laid out in, in the energy master plan um, and uh, and you know, Keeping it flat is an idea. Is an ideal. Um, I, I I do hope there are reductions. Um, I think uh, the shutdown of the dirtiest of the plants will have an effect. Um, uh, but over the long term, we have to think about the energy demand. So uh, the energy demand increase. Ken, can you hear me? Yes. Now we can. That's Hannah's back. Great. Yes, Hannah's back. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so it sounds like I missed some really interesting conversation. Uh, while I was dialing back in, but I did want to clarify that the EMP largely to the extent that the gas plants are still active, you know, in the later years, it's largely for balancing purposes. So I did just want to clarify that, that even within the EMP and even retaining some of these gas plants, it does presume a drastic reduction in emissions because it is met by new renewable builds and you're really just using those, those gas plants for those uh, really not only low renewable days, but really low renewable you know, weeks and seasons when your battery storage isn't going to be enough. And of course, we're also recognized we're looking 30 years out and a lot could change in the next three decades. Um, so I just did, I did want to make that clarifying point. Um, and I don't want to over speak since I know I missed some really critical conversations, but um, happy to jump in again if, uh, if you need me. Yeah, so, so Hannah, the discussions were on energy efficiency, which I think you've touched on, or and BPU is the lead on that. Um, we talked about the the need for the existing power plants to stay online, um, and maybe it's going to be a shift in their fuel source from, uh, you know, uh, virgin natural gas to renewable uh, uh, gases. But uh, you know, it, the need for the existing power power plants to stay online is is the question that's being asked right now, and and keeping those those emission levels static or even a slight decline is not enough. Is, do you want to kind of address that? Sure. Um, well, I think there was um, an intent that at least existing plants right now would probably stay online, but that's not to say that they would be run at the same capacity that they currently are over time. Um, so so I, I think there's definitely room. I mean, I at this point, like meaning today, this year, I'd be more concerned about leakage um, and whether our efforts were being counterproductive um, while we are still working through how this affects our participation in REGI and being a member of PJM. Um, but I, I mean, I do think overall that certainly, you know, there is room to, to cut down emissions, certainly starting with the dirtiest plants and using this rule to, um, to accelerate the renewable builds as well, because the renewable build should also, whether it's in New Jersey or PJM in general, should be able to displace some of that dirtier generation throughout PJM because it's cheaper. All right. Um, I think we've answered the questions on energy efficiency and on some of these uh, the uh, our reports um, that are that are coming out um, and how we're dealing with that. 
Next comment is from Ken Dulski. <laughs> Here's an idea. Had the DEP stop logging our state forests and diminishing our ability to sequester carbon. Um, I do know land use is going to be having uh, a series of stakeholder com, uh, mm -hmm. meetings and uh, maybe a better uh, comment or suggestion for them, but I will certainly share this comment with them. Uh, I am not by any means an expert on logging in 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 the, in the state. So I just want to say this is just out of total absolute frustration that the DEP is allowing the Audubon Society to run this state and allow logging while at the same time trying to tell us that it's going to improve uh, uh, sequestration. It's, I won't use the four letter words that I want to, but it's just, it, it, it is, it's blasphemous. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you. I will, sh I will share your comments with the land use folks though. Um, Mike Russell is responding to Matt. This is something we'll be looking at as we work on the impacts. Are you okay with reaching? Okay, Mike, you'll follow up with uh, Matt. Thank you. Kim, um, Kim Scarborough, uh, as the DEP de department, uh, as the department prepares for its analysis on any potential emissions tr reduction strategy to evaluate leakage and reliability, will there be an opportunity to comment on the assumptions that will go into the modeling? Um, Kim, I, I don't know if you have anything else you want to say on that uh, before before we respond. I just know when the BPU was doing its um, most recent update to the EMP, um, there was an opportunity to comment on the modeling assumptions. Just trying to figure out whether or not BP has something similar in mind. All right, um, we haven't gotten to the point where we are doing the modeling. Um, Bob Kettig and CSERP and Hannah from BPU, if there is modeling done, would be the uh, modeling group. So uh, Bob or Hannah, do you want to comment on that? From a rule writing perspective, we would certainly share any of our thoughts and ideas and assumptions. Um, yeah, hi, this is Hannah. Uh, Kim, I can I can get back to you. I know that and, and Bob, feel free to jump in. You might be more um, more in tune with the latest uh, modeling that we're doing for Reggie, um, but I can certainly get back to you on that one. OK, yeah, thanks. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, this is Bob. Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, Kim, certainly um, as we, you know, move forward and, you know, we're looking at the impact of, you know, not not just the CO2 rule issues we're talking about today, but just carbon pricing and Reggie in general. Um, you know, modeling is a is a continuing component of the Reggie program, and it, you know it has been since its inception to understand the implications of the policy and carbon pricing and the impact that has on uh, electricity and potential dispatch shifts. Kim, do we answer? Kim, do, we answer? do we answer your questions, Kim? Yeah, I just like I said, I just wanted to know if there was an opportunity to comment prior to the modeling, um, just not after the fact. That's all. OK, thank you. Um, next comment is from Dave Pringle. Teeing this back up, uh, question back up for from Ken, thinking it got lost in the sauce. Now that New Jersey planners must use the 20 year lifetime for methane emissions, is the EMP and IEP going to be redone to reflect this? Um, I cannot answer that question. Again, I'm going to throw this over the fence to Hannah. Uh, I think we'll take a look at everything on, you know, the three year cycle. Um, you know, uh, we said it was a living document. Absolutely believe that, but it's not going to be living 24 seven um, because we're probably going to have to start gearing up for the next three year run really quite soon. Um, but we will absolutely be looking at all changes, um, including anything that's happened through the legislature as well as um, international scientific guidance. Let me uh, let me elaborate on that a little. Um, I mean, it's this isn't pending legislation. It's law the governor signed over a year ago. So um, yeah, don't expect the the plan to get updated immediately. But um, there seems to be a very large disconnect. Uh, throughout the administration from the governor's signature of that bill to implementing it. Obviously, we're not going to go back and immediately revise the energy master plan, but um, you know, we're now six to nine months into rulemaking here and 
Yeah. We, we have yet to hear the administration really acknowledge, let alone say how they're going to implement this this law that's absolutely critical. That's that's directly at the heart of this initiative. OK. Um, I, I think it's, you know, in, in my my answer to that, um, uh, Dave, is it's it's going to be at least from the DEP perspective, it's going to be done in pieces um, and where we are a piece of the puzzle, we will certainly plug that hole or put that puzzle piece right. together. Um, how it fits in with the overall plan, I, I can't give you all the specifics because we don't know. Um, and and it is a moving target, uh, uh, but as but as far as the energy master plan that we, we uh, rely on our counterparts. Right. Um, but it but certainly does drive our decisions. What what's driving DEP rulemaking here isn't just the energy master plan, but the governor EO 100 in the mm -hmm. PAC rules overall. And methane is a critical part of that. Um, and that that's obvious. As is black carbon, we haven't even talked about black carbon yet in this. And I know this is perhaps farther afield from this particular rule, but you know, with uh, you know, if if it's not appropriate here, you know, DEP needs to be put on notice that you know th there are a lot of other these pieces that you're going to be having conversations with later today and in, in, in the next couple of weeks. You know, if if you're not talking 20 year time horizon in the these rulemakings, especially with black carbon and methane, um, you know, you're setting yourself up for a whole lot of trouble. Understood. Yeah, uh, and this, and I, this, is, and, this, this is Ken Dosky. I'm sorry, I'm just going to jump in real fast. If you don't at least do the math with the 20 year time frame, you don't know what your targets are. I mean, you don't have to rewrite the whole EMP, but just update the emission numbers so you have accurate data as to what you're shooting at. You're underestimating GHGs right now, and then 10 years from now, you're going to find out, oh, well, we, we had the wrong target. Sorry. That, that's all right, Ken. Thank you. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, we we are we are working within the scope uh, of of every, every, every everything you you said, uh, Dave. You my you may recall my opening slides from this morning referenced the MP, it referenced the EO one hundred, um, and 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 the PAC rules are driven based on both those documents. And I think you'll find a sprinkling of the methane and, and short-lived climate uh, pollutants uh, kind of discussion throughout, more so than some of the other discussions than this power plant sector discussion. But all right, um, next comment uh, from Jeff Tettle. Reggie calls for a 30% reduction. Uh, 2030 EMP says gas generation going down, going to drop substantial, and yet we are coming up with standards that will maintain the status quo. The standard DP has has to go lower than 800 megawatts per hour. Also, LAIR, lowest achievable emission rate, can get to new generation down to 750 megawatts per hour. New Jersey also looking at uh, FFR and leaving PJM action could prevent leakage. So when when we put slides up that said a number, uh, it was an example. Uh, it was to show the math. Um, uh, we agree uh, LAIR is probably something south, a little bit of 750. Um, uh, what an ex what a new plant can do versus what an existing plant can do is is some of those uh, questions we have to uh, address, um, and uh, we also have to address uh, what a combined cycle, uh, very efficient unit can do versus a simple cycle. So, Dave, I don't know uh, if you want to kind of add your thoughts on on this comment. Well, I just meant that we need to, you know, as I said before, we need to do a step down rule, um, getting us to the lowest achievable rates that we can get at. And that, and also with the existing plants, there are many of them that are not efficient and even, you know, and that really should get phased out uh, as, you know, the renewables come in. And then my last point is, you know, that because of what's happening with FERC and the PJM, because they want to put a basically a tariff or a fee on clean generation to subsidize fossil fuels, you know, I know BPU and, you know, and Hannah could jump in if she wants, is looking at, you know, we, we'd set up an FRR and do our own auction, which would help protect the cleaner sources. And that in turn would help keep out dirtier sources from out of state. So, you know, those are things that are moving parts, but I think, you know, you need to be looking at that as part of, um, you know, as you're developing your rules. Yeah, and standards. Thanks. 
Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, and I, I, I don't want to get into high level politics, but um, it, it is a, a challenge to move New Jersey forward when uh, so many things seem to be going in a different direction, uh, which makes it all, all that much more difficult. So, um, Dave, did you want to add anything to that? Dave Owen? Um, no, I mean, basically, like I said, the, that 860 was was a an example. I mean, it, it's not a number that's, you know, being set in stone. You know, we could be lower, we could be higher in the end. Um, and that's, you know, one of the purposes of this, this discussion is to try and get a feel as to what that number should be. And as Ken alluded to, whether uh, we should have different limits for peaking units as, than for the, uh, you know, combined cycle units that operate at a much higher capacity factor. So, um, you know, that's just what I wanted to say. Okay. All right, um, Eric Ford, um, how does this impact re reliability for the electric and energy grid and needs what and what lessons learned are being used from California's current blackout? Um, I, I cannot answer any of those. Um, <laughs> I, I I would defer. I'm not even sure Hannah or or, or Bob can answer those. Um, but one of the things I, I did say earlier, there will always have to be reliability considerations put into any rulemaking. Um, there's always going to have to be emergency provisions put into any rulemaking. Um, so that that that's kind of what I, I I I will I will say from the rulemaking perspective. Uh, Bob or Hannah, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I would I would really view these as two, you know, re related but separate conversations. We are still currently part of PJM, you know, I mean, PSEG is on the line. We have um, huge mandates with respect to reliability. Um, so I would not really be concerned at this point that, you know, tightening the requirements for greenhouse gas emissions from our uh, fossil fuel burning units is going to be uh, a huge problem at this point, especially while we are still, you know, part of the grid, uh, considering FRR as well as ramping up renewables and storage. All right. Um, there are no more comments in the comment field. There's no one raising their hand, but uh, but I will say we, we we've heard a lot from the environmental side. I, I do want to hear and have a open air discussion. Anything on on? I know there's a lot of EGU personnel on the call. Uh, anything you want to say? Anything you want to share? Any any concerns with this approach? Uh, any better methodology? Uh, I'd I'd like to keep this an open dialogue and and have a back and forth discussion if at all possible. Um. OK. Um, well, what we're going to do uh, if if uh, we don't have any more comments and there's no raised hands up, oh, there's a raised hand. Hold on a second. Let me get there. Lisa, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Lisa, if, uh, do you know how to unmute yourself by hitting the microphone on the uh, toolbar? Uh, Lisa, if you can't do the uh, toolbar, maybe uh, if you put something in the conversation. I, I, I do see you have your raised hand, but you're muted and there's nothing in the conversation. So either one of those, either uh, Unmute yourself with the microphone or put something in the conversation. All right. I don't think I can unmute you, so. Well, Lisa's trying to figure that out. Does anybody have anything else they want to discuss?
this is Kim. I guess I'll just jump in again. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Kim. I, I just think this is why, um, you know, I just asked the question about the modeling and the analysis. I, I think once we understand what the potential impacts could be for whatever emission reduction strategy that you're thinking of, I think we'll be able to provide more informed um, feedback. As we look at it, as far as um, you know, the impact of leakage and reliability um, and cost. Okay, so you're, so you're looking for any of the modeling and assumptions that are going to go into any of the rulemaking. So, so one of the challenges we have with this rulemaking, uh, we're supposed to be proposing in early 2021. Uh, we lost several months, as I said earlier, due to uh, COVID and to uh, furloughs. Um, uh, both COVID related, um, but uh, it's going to be a challenge to get anything proposed by 2021. Um, this is the stakeholder meeting we're having on EGU, so you know there, there's not going to be an. I don't envision, I should say, another stakeholder meeting uh, related to EGUs at this point. Um, but as we go through, if we if we have assumptions and if we have modeling that we can share, we will certainly share what we can. Um, as we develop rules, um, you know, the rule development is kind of uh, a, a, a formal process and, and that can only get shared at certain points in time. Um, but any what we can share ahead of time, we, we will. So Lisa, still no luck with the microphone. OK. Um, before I close this out, anybody else want to say anything? Well, uh, Ken. We still yes, have a couple right. more discussion slides that we haven't gotten oh. to yet. So if you want to. Well, hold on a second. I, I got a, I got a couple. OK, we'll, we'll get to them in a second, Dave. I just OK. Uh, Mark Driscoll, go ahead if you want to uh, turn off your mic. Hi, can you turn on okay. your mic? Yes. OK, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the applicability to new EGUs versus existing EGUs? As to what the if there'll be a, a sliding scale of emission rates for new versus older plants, or if you're planning to implement the same emission rate for all units? Well, well, I mean, that's uh, one of our discussion topics is that we're coming well, back to you. We were talking about new versus existing and also, uh, you know, peaker versus, uh, you know, the regular combined cycle uh, units as well. So, you know what what you think might be more appropriate so so mark i i think the answer is there's probably what makes sense is is multiple emission limits based on the type of unit and its existing or proposed status um uh, you know there's a strong push uh, uh as uh someone just suggested recently and i can't remember if it was jeff or tom but or ken uh to to push layer um and layers low low achievable emission reduction um we can't always do that on an existing unit um it, it doesn't always work uh so there may have to be a, a different standard on an existing unit than a new unit on the flip side that old really inefficient unit that's existing out there um is going to have a, a, a challenge meeting whatever the new limit is. Um, uh, so I, I, it, I, I suspect there will be different limits for existing versus new. I suspect okay. there will be different limits for um, different types of units. Uh, so those are all things that are going to be under consideration and, and whatever you can feed us as what you think is appropriate. Again, it's all going to be shared with the stakeholder group um, is, is what we're, th we're thinking about. Dave, do you want to add to that? No, that's basically what I was saying is that though his questions were all questions that we're, we're uh, trying to consider. OK. Um, uh, Ken Adolski, I see you have your hand up again. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. So I'd like to comment on exactly that same issue about what might be appropriate for a new power plant. Um, we've been very, very deeply involved in analyzing this New Jersey Transit you know, proposed project. Um, what we have found, you know, they're planning to build a gas power plant. Uh, what we have found is that for the application that they're talking about, 
that it should be perfectly feasible to build what's called a hybrid microgrid. That is a microgrid that's powered by solar and store, you know, and uses storage and uses a small amount of gas to keep the batteries charged when, you know, there's not enough solar for, for those periods of time. It's a totally different architecture. It's a totally different <laughs> technology. Um, and so having a rule that says, well, a new plant should only be able to emit X amount of uh, whatever you, you know, pounds of uh, GHGs per hour uh, would be totally inappropriate to looking at what would be a, you know, a better solution for a new power plant. And so, you know, you need to expand your definition of, of what's available and, and how that, how new power plants should be evaluated. If you could do something along the lines of the hybrid microgrid that we talked about, and I'd be happy to talk to you, you know, offline about what our findings are on this. Um, it's a totally different equation. It totally removes the, the greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions from the equation, you know, and um, it, 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 it's, it would move us tremendously, you know, much, much more quickly towards our goal here than to say, okay, we'll build a new gas plant, but it's got to be, you know, twice as efficient as, as a current plant. I mean, that's still a bad solution. Uh, so, Ken, anything you can share would be greatly appreciated. Um, and uh, as far as NJ Transit Grid, there's been a lot of discussions about it. Um, the application came in some time ago. Um, I, I, I don't really want to talk about it today specifically, but um, it will certainly have its day in the public forum uh, at, at some point. Thanks. All right, there was another comment in the comment fields. OK. Uh, Oh, actually, Lisa, uh, I'm going to jump to Lisa since she had her hand up for a while. She did make a comment. Um, I'm on the phone line and I'm muted my phone, but I couldn't find an unmute on the screen. I'll send. OK, uh, yeah, if you could send written comments, Lisa, we'd appreciate that and 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 we'll take them. Um, if you want to write some quick blurb in the chat here, we can certainly uh, try to respond to them in, in a in a open session, too. A uh, comment from John Pandolf. Uh, the discussion implies a single emission rate for existing EGUs. Permitting practices for new units have, and it got cut off. I think we just touched on that um, anyway, uh, talking about existing versus new and different types of units. Um, but John, if there's anything you want to add to that discussion, by all means, uh, unmute yourself. Well, thank you, Ken. Um, no, actually, there's not really much more I have to say except I did notice that in permitting new units, you know, it is based on the type of unit and its um, efficiency or heat rate, you know, because in each of the new units seem to have different emission f emission f um, limits. So I just wanted to ensure that going forward we would do something similar for existing EGUs. So thank you for the time. Okay. Dave, why don't you cover the balance of what you wanted to talk about? OK, why don't you go to the next slide, Heidi? OK. Now, the next topics you know, that I envisioned was, uh, you know, how would we allocate renewable generation to an EGU? And we have the questions of installing new renewable generation at a facility. Uh, may work in a few cases, but not in all. Uh, you know, building new renewable generation elsewhere in New Jersey, New Jersey and becoming a partner in uh, new renewable, renewable generation projects in New Jersey. And related to that, can you go to move, move on to slide 16, Heidi? Uh, and the questions of, you know, how do we, al how would uh, that, be allocated to an EGU. Again, that refers to the last slide. And how would an owner or operator sub allocate their total allocation to each EGU under their control? So if a company say, you know, as, as uh, you know, from Mark, Mark Driscoll from Talon Energy has, uh, what is it? How many? A few facilities, I think it's three or four. Um, you know, and, you know, if they were to choose to, uh, go into one 
one project, one renewable project, you know, how, how they would uh, divvy up their total renewable generation amongst their EGUs. And the third question is, would renewable capacity be allocated to the facilities or to the individual unit? So if a facility has, you know, three or four uh, units at their facility or two, could could we do this whole thing on a facility wide basis or would we uh, want to do it um, on an individual EGU basis? So those are the, the questions that, you know, I I was I was thinking about on that topic. So I don't know if anybody has anything else to add. And I acknowledge this uh, whole concept may be at a left field to a, to a, a lot of the power facilities. Um, maybe even something uh, Enviros didn't consider us uh, thinking about. Uh, um, but you know, th this has a very what we think a very positive effect on promoting and endorsing and pushing the renewable energy portfolio in New Jersey. Um, so, you know. The devil's always in the details and and how we get there. So, um, feedback on this uh, would would be hugely beneficial. Go ahead, Kim. I see your hand up. Is there a reason why it's only limited to New Jersey and not within renewable new renewables within uh, PJM? That's a good question. Um, are are uh, some some of the the reason we we originally when we had this discussion we said New Jersey. Uh, and it gets back to something Nikki Sheets said earlier. Um, if we're if we're going to do mitigation, uh, <laughs> preference is always nearby. Um, and you know, I, I use the example of a NORC facility and a, and a NORC rooftop slash parking lot, and, and that was semi intentional to share the thought process of nearby is desirable. Now you can argue and easily make the argument CO2 is a worldwide issue. Um, the CO2 emitted, atom emitted in Antarctica has the same effect as one in China versus the United States. Um, but there is always co-benefits with all the things we're doing. Um, and uh, you know, the, the mitigation, the dollars spent, um, we, we were thinking New Jersey centric. Um, so one of the questions Dave asked earlier, it does it have to be at the proximity? Does it have to be at the facility? Does it have to be in the proximity of the facility or does it have to be in New Jersey? Um, we didn't really wanna think about opening it up to other states and solar projects. We would uh, certainly have a tough time tracking or, 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 or record keeping on that, but um, Put your thoughts in, put them in writing if you want, uh, and we certainly have heard you on this call, Kim. Um, FYI, if you uh, read the chat, um, Hannah has posted um, uh, an announcement uh, about BPU holding a technical conference on sep September 18th. Uh, it's a discussion on resource adequacy, and there's a link, which I assume is a registration link, Hannah, um, for joining that discussion. Yes, it's the public notice, which includes the registration link. Okay. Um, Christine, uh, oh, Christine reminded, I, I did say it earlier, but for those of you that have only done the phone call in, there's no way that I can identify if you have a question, but if you want to star six, uh, you can unmute yourself and just break in during a lull, if you will. Um, but uh, I did say that earlier, but just a reminder, can't hurt. Um, Nikki, I'll get to you in a second. Ken Dolsky has a, a comment already in. To what extent are you going to promote uh, RGEA, and I, I, I hate to admit it, I don't know what that stands for, programs to municipalities to drive the market for RECs and renewable energy content. Bob or Hannah, can you educate me on uh, RGEA? Uh, so I think GEA, uh, are you, Ken, are you talking about the government energy aggregation programs? Yeah, this is a program that I believe the BPU sponsored and was passed by statute to enable towns to purchase renewable energy content um, and increase the demand for clean energy. 
Um, that's a really good question. I don't know um, that that would be affected by the rule, but just as a general note, it's a good point, and I'll absolutely take it back to the clean energy team. Okay. Uh, Nikki, go ahead if you want to just unmute yourself. Yeah, I just want to, I, I appreciate it, uh, what you said before about, about the local aspect of this. And, um, and I, I think from the EJ community that this is kind of a new idea, you know, allocating this renewable energy. So obviously you have to think about it more. But I did want to echo, some, uh, echo something that Jeff said before that, you know, is, is this alloc is the renewable allocation, is it going to displace generation from the plant so that emissions will go down? Because from the EJ perspective, that's certainly what we want, you know, in that local area. I mean, we we if, if it's just going to be additional allocation, so it won't go up, which is good, but we really want the emissions of these particular plants, especially in EJ communities, to go down. And I'm wondering, you know, if 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 that will be the case, if that will necessarily be the case um, with the allocation of the renewables. Nikki. Um I can I can neither I, I can't say for sure that emissions will go down. Um, what I can say is I don't uh, see emissions going up um, at an individual facility. Um, what I can say is it'll certainly spur um, uh, renewable energy. Um, uh, and you know your question that you said earlier about can we have a special consideration for EJ areas. That's something we're going to have to take back. The one area where I do see it going down, and and you could argue it's a paperwork exercise. Um, if a if a plant is permitted, and I'm just going to make up a number for 100 tons of emissions, um, and you know they've they've their historical capacity uh, or utilization has only been 25 percent, they may choose. Uh, to ratchet down their own permit allowable limit to a, a value uh, around 25 tons or 30 tons or something, give them a little space, but uh, they may ratchet down their permitted limits. Uh, it may not have an effect on their actual emissions, but their permitted limits would go down in, in that sense. So I, I do share that. Um, I'm going to let Bob Kedig jump in front. Go ahead, Bob. Hi, just... Um yeah, just to to um, respond to Nikki's question about whether emissions go down, I, I think it's just helpful to look at it in the context of um, how renewables affect the overall emissions of the grid. So what we're talking about in this rule is having um, renewables uh, enter the grid and essentially um, dilute the rate of that new generation. The, the reality, what would happen to the grid emissions being that the renewables in this case, case it would most likely be um, solar PV that they dispatch independent of whatever the, the the price is on a given day in the wholesale market. So they're price takers. Um, what would happen to the the emissions in the grid is that it would have an incremental lowering of emissions in that that megawatt hour of that new solar that comes online would would be dispatched and would theoretically displace the next megawatt hour on the margin and PJM dispatches on the margin. It's, you know, it's going to be fossil. The, the nuclear plants and the renewables are, are uh, typically price takers and dispatch regardless of the price. So, um, you know, the effect would be a, a lowering, a marginally lowering of the grid. And as we get more renewables come online, that would be displacing more of uh, the the fossil on the the marginal dispatch whether you could at at what we're talking about you couldn't tie it to a specific power plant right, right. well and that that's why you know from the ej perspective we we want to make sure ej communities have access to renewables energy efficiency but since you can't tie the reductions to a specific location then for us you know with respect to reductions there we we obviously want reduction to go down overall but you know for us just like with real estate this location 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 right so it's, it's, yeah and I, I think that no right. agreed and and I, and I think that's you know as the rule develops you know we had a conversation about you know from Kim does it is it limited to New Jersey 
you know, does it go beyond New Jersey? And, you know, we hadn't, we, to, to my knowledge, we hadn't, we hadn't thought of expanding it beyond New Jersey, but um, yeah, understood. There's that conversation that to, to have it um, limited to a geographic area and provide opportunity for, you know, that community to um, have some of the more um, um, localized benefits of, of, of installing the renewables to whether expanding it throughout the state. I think that that would be part of the rule development where to draw the boundaries. But just regardless of where you put it, if it dispatches to the grid, um, it's going to have the same net effect that it's going to displ displace that that marginal that marginal dispatch. If you displace it, if it's behind the meter and it was taking the place of like on site generation somewhere, um, then that's a different story. That is actually yeah. displacing you know a generator on site. Right, and that's why I wonder maybe if they had to run less because they have the allocation, then that might you know, and that would result in some reductions if if, if that's how it works. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you know, you know, again, I mean, I, I, you know, a, a, a appreciate this is a, you know really one of the more freeform stakeholder meetings I think that we've had and and open to ideas, um, you know, but certainly displacing have a priority to displace on site. Um, generation. Uh, I mean, I think that could be part of the conversation moving forward. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, there's one written comment I want to get to, and then I'll get to you, Dave. Um, let's see. John Valeri, given the answer to the last question from Kim, is the thought that the renewable energy component would be similar to an emission offset requirement? Um, boy, um, I hope it's not as complicated as emission offsets are. Uh, emission offsets is subchapter 18 of the uh, New Jersey air rules and uh, you need a PhD to understand it. Um, I hope it's simpler than that, um, but it will certainly need to be tracked, recorded and maintained in some fashion. So John, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that question or my answer. Yeah, I guess the, the <clears throat> um, um, and obviously I need to, I, we're hearing this. I'm hearing this for the first time. and need to digest it, but you know, I'm thinking of this in terms of a permit. And um, w what is a permittee going to have to do to comply? And so we talked about locational aspects of renewables. Um, we talked about uh, you know what's being calculated as a percentage. You know, the question becomes not only what do you impose, but how how is it implemented, and how difficult is it to implement? And I agree with you on the complexity of the emission offset rules. It really wasn't about that rule per se, but so the conceptually, how does a how does a permittee look at their requirement and 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 know what they're complying with? And that's that that's the reason why I asked the question: Is it going to be X number of tons translated into a meg, megawatts of, of 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 solar that they must produce within X number of miles? And I use the term X deliberately because that's a type of thing that makes a permit easier to comply with so when there's a defined number, uh, whatever the opinion is on what the number actually is. So that's that's there, there's an implementability question as well as a substantive question on this. Yeah, I, thank you, John. I and I do understand that. It, and the way I envision it is, it will be a number that will have to be met at a certain point in time and the number may change over time um, and there should be enough time lag where it can be addressed in a timely manner time in there three times um, but all those things would have to be uh, addressed in a permit approval uh, and or documented in some fashion so uh, again what i said earlier the devil's in the details yep so okay thank you all right um, i'm going to read two comments from jeff tittle and then uh maybe answer it and uh, and 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 let you talk but why uh, jeff did why wouldn't you do both reduce co2 per megawatt hour while adding renewables and storage to reduce plant operations uh, i'll answer that one first i i think we are doing both of those uh, keep in mind in stakeholder session number one back in february we talked about having a hard limit on plants that are just too high emitting right now uh at, at this point um, so there will be a number that we're going to guess that just can't be met by certain plants without overly costly controls uh, or some kind of uh, crazy technology that that isn't out there yet. Um, 
Um, they will have the option of building solar to offset, but I, again, I think it would be too big a lift for, well, actually, no, that is a hard cap. I don't go the solar route. Uh, so, and then the second would be the promoting the renewables for those where they're marginal or even efficient plants uh, over time. So I, I think we are addressing both. Um, and to your second question, this uh, or comment, this could be targeted to overburdened communities to meet cumulative impact legislation. Um, I, and you called it cum cumulative impact legislation. I called it EJ legislation. I think it's the same thing. Um, once once that legislation uh, hit, hit, hits our, our desks, um, we have a whole new paradigm. Uh, I shouldn't say whole new paradigm. A lot of us already think in that paradigm. Um, but how how we address overburdened communities um, and cumulative impacts uh, will be part of the discussion. Um, and anything that was said today is actually taken as part of our notes and part of our feedback. And uh, you know we're going to vet this with senior management and say here's some of the ideas and here's some of the thoughts um, and and where do we go from here. So all this is feedback. So Jeff, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and. Say anything further uh, yeah, to I what you think that, I just think that we, you know, given the pandemic and how it impacts EJ and overburdened communities, um, you know, with you know areas that have the worst air quality seem to have the, you know, are having the worst impacts from both um, the rates of COVID and mortality. Um, that I think it gives a new and more urgent. Uh, you know, reason to going after these plants, especially in these communities. And again, you know, you look at a place like Newark, where within a mile or so of each other, you've got four power plants and an incinerator and a proposed power plant right across the river in, um, in Kearney with another power plant next to it. And you just realize how we're in it, you know, how we're destroying these communities and, and choking people to death. And that given the two, you know, because, you know, and, you know, Pringle's point too is, you know, with black carbon and methane, that this is our chance to really go after um, and and really help to reduce pollution in those communities by one, reducing emissions, and two, by replacing um, generation with renewables so that we can reduce emissions even more. And I think, you know, when you look at, you know, once you, I mean, these, you know, many of these communities in the state and, you know, are, not only F level, but the air is, you know, unhealthy. Um, and so this is a way of trying to get at that and provide equity in, uh, in electrical generation. I'll end it there. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, and, Je and Jeff, I, and I agree. And, and, and keep in mind, we're talking three days of stakeholder, uh, three separate days of stakeholder meeting. We're focused on EGUs right here, and I'm going to address the the next comment as, as part of my answer to, to you also. But what about those other pollutants, short-lived uh, climate pollutants, especially black carbon? And Dave touched on Dave Owen touched on this earlier. From a power plant perspective, it's all about the CO2 reduction, and and those other things that come down are going to be good. Uh, but it's about the CO2 reduction. It is the main driver, the main impetus, and and the the biggest piece of the puzzle. For some of the other rules we're going to be talking about over the next three days of stakeholdering, some of those other things will have more of an impact on those pollutant types. It's going to have more of an impact on the EJ communities in particular. Um, the power plants is a harder fit uh, than some others uh, for for the other pollutants and 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 some of those EJ issues. Um, but. Uh, let me, uh, there's someone's had their hand up for a while now. Go ahead, Mark Driscoll, uh, if you want to un unsilence yourself. Okay, well, you know, I, I, I appreciate your request for information from the EGU, so I'm going to share a few things with you, uh, especially with respect to this first slide. Just recently, this past week, I was called by my boss and she asked me, hey, what are the environmental concerns for putting battery storage at all of our sites? Okay. Well, that's something that Talon is considering at all of the EGU units in the state of New Jersey. I don't believe that's a one standalone project somewhere where the plants could piggyback off of that, but I believe they're looking at individual sites. Okay. And uh, that, that's about all I've heard on that. But just to take a step back when, when you're asking for input from us, I, I can tell you the four sites that we have in New Jersey, their emission rates are in the order of 1050 to 1250. Okay. Um, if that helps you 
with with knowing what the numbers are for these types of plants. They're not peakers, but they don't run all the time either. They depend mostly on the weather, whether they run. They're sit and wait plants. They sit there and they wait. When they get the day ahead call, they, they prepare themselves to operate the next day. That's normally weather dependent. And then, of course, in this day and age, it's, it's, it is somewhat financially dependent because gas is at a very, very low price now. So they do get dispatched a little more often than, say, over the past several summers because of the low price of gas. So with that, the input that, that I would like to share with you, the, the way to keep these plants viable, they wouldn't be able to meet an 860 pound per megawatt hour limit. However, the thing that we would be able to use in our permits would be a permitted limit in tons, basically, because we don't run all that much. So for plants like this to remain viable in, in the electricity market today, that's what would be necessary is some sort of finite limit on tons, maybe per season or per year. Mark, do you mind if I ask uh, just a couple follow-ups? Um, I, I hear you loud and clear, and uh, you're not a peaker. You're a peaker light, maybe. Um, uh, uh, but you, you have some some challenges, and and it, the ton per year limit is is something you could work with. And and we, Dave and I talked about it earlier, but putting your capacity factor into your permit uh, would essentially put a ton per year limit on there. That's right. Um, and and you'd have a little less to overcome in the denominator on Dave's discussion uh, right. for procuring uh, renewable or building, you know, getting new new uh, renewable energy out there. I you know the the battery discussion is is interesting to me. Um, you know if 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 the batteries were to happen, you know, how, what would be your thought on how you would be charging those? W would you be filling in the valleys in lieu of these plants? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that at this point. I have very little information. Um, it, it, it's something that's just kicked off. As I mentioned to you, I, I just got the call this week and was asked the question. Okay. So but what I did find out is, is this small, they don't last that long, you know, the batteries, I, I think the packs last between two and four hours, you know, at, at a 20 megawatt level. So th there's, there's a lot of more homework to do on that. But what I can add to the description of the plants, remember they're, they're cogeneration units, but they're combined cycle. So they don't start up quickly. Mm -hmm. That's, that's their biggest disadvantage. It takes, there's, there's four sites. It takes anywhere from say two to four, four to five hours, depending upon which site you talk to, really get up and get steady state. So when they are dispatched, they're not peakers. They don't run for an hour or two. They'll probably run for maybe a minimum of six or seven hours to a maximum of maybe 12 to 14 hours, depending upon how hot it is that day. Yep. Yeah, we've 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 done a lot of analysis of the um, um, Oh, I can't remember the data source now. The uh, all, all the P, all the uh, emission data from uh, the power units, uh, CAMD, CAMD data, and, and and we do analyze those peaks and valleys of individual individual units, and we do see how much is uh, used and and looked at it, uh, uh, how much it's used on a on a regular basis. So thank you, though. Okay. All right. Um. Let me see. Um. Oof. Dave, you have your hand up. Uh, Dave Pringle, that is. Um, and you have a couple comments. Uh, you talked about uh, the 20 year time horizon. Again, we, we had talked about that. And I think I addressed your comment about the short lived uh, climate pollutants and especially black carbon. Doesn't fit real well in necessarily with this rule, but it will certainly come into play with some of the other rules um, that we're going to be discussing over the next two and a half days of, uh, stakeholdering half day today and, and the next two over the next two weeks. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that discussion, Dave? Um, just, um, it might not be a major source, but it's still a significant source, both from a chronic health effect perspective. This is black carbon coming out. Even when you're burning methane, you know, you're, you're emitting soot. 
So this seems to be an, uh, an opportunity to go with what, what Nikki was talking about, um, going after co pollutants too, um, especially when you factor in you know, black carbon's impact in terms of a short lived climate pollutant. So um, you know, are, are you saying you're not going to be looking at black carbon at all through the through the stack rule um, because it's and 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 if so, the reason that is you're making the determination that the vast majority of soot is coming from somewhere else, not not a smokestack. No, no, not 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 quite. Uh, what I was saying was the rule driver us doing something or not doing something is really going to be driven based on the amount of CO2 emissions. Um, any benefits or costs um, will certainly account for all those other pollutants. And, and Dave did talk about those. There's still the methane releases. There's still uh, N2O, the nitrous oxide emissions. Um, any of those other co-benefits would still be accounted for and addressed um, as, as far as what we're doing in the rule. But it, it, what I was suggesting was CO2 is driving the need for power plants being addressed. Um, the other the other pollutants are of concern. CO2 is the biggest concern at power plants. That, so, 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 so part of the rulemaking will be analysis or modeling that will by with, with CO2 is the driver uh, along with that that the driving down of emissions from CO2, there will be some commensurate additional reductions with additional benefits and costs that will be, be evaluated throughout the rulemaking. We, we always account for, I shouldn't say always, we generally account for any of the secondary uh, contributions uh, as best we can. So if there are co-benefits, we will try to uh, account for those um, and, and address those. Okay. Um, uh, let me just... I lost my train of thought. Uh, where am I here? OK, um, the next comment, uh, Barb, as I only have for the name, uh, is the bat if the battery is charging off the grid, it doesn't reduce emissions. It would have to charge with only clean energy to have an impact on reducing emissions to s instead of shifting them around. Um, yes, Barb, that is correct. Um, uh, there's a lot of ways batteries can work. Um, you can charge your battery during those days when it, uh, uh, it is very sunny out um, rather than dispatching to the grid. Um, you can charge a battery with a clean, and I'll quote clean, uh, a cleaner natural gas power plant. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to be charging my battery with the dirtiest power plants, um, but uh, those are all things that have to be considered with batteries. Um, batteries are not clearly are not a a a, uh, a renewable energy. They they still have to get fed um, and do have a certain amount of loss associated with that. So there's actually another inefficiency built in. But what batteries can be very good about is flattening out the need for that high high demand cycle time of energy where the dirtiest of the power plants could be called on to to be needed. So. Um, I don't know if you uh, want to add anything else to that, um, if you want to unmute yourself, but that, that's kind of how I see batteries fitting into the puzzle. Dave, I don't know, if there, Dave Owen, if you want to add anything to that on batteries. No, I think you basically touched it. I mean, I would envision you know, batteries being charged at the off, you know, times of off peak demand or, you know, solar, the, the peak solar, uh, maybe peak solar production uh, and then being used uh, during the during the uh, periods of peak demand. Mm -hmm. So you would be offsetting the, uh, the the power plants that would be emitting, you know, more in, you know, in the higher amount of uh, CO2 pounds per megawatt hour. So. Yeah, this is Barb. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so this is Barb Blumenthal. Um, so the modeling that you were describing could be used to pinpoint the location. It's, it isn't just put batteries anywhere. It's where do they belong, where they have the greatest impact. 
Mm-hmm. And so these are very, it's not as simple as I'm going to put a battery at a particular power plant and somehow that is going to reduce emissions. That is not at all clear. So the analysis can inform decisions about where batteries do the most good to offset emissions. Is that what you were thinking, that the analysis would get into that kind of uh, granular detail? Um, That wasn't what I was thinking, but it is a very good point. Um, And that would probably be something we'd need help with from BPU and or CSERP, our our sister group, to do some of that modeling. Um, In a general sense, um, if you have peaking units throughout the state, uh, kind of copying the New York City model, you could hypothetically replace those peaking units throughout the plate state with battery units. Um, and they're essentially at the same locations. The grid works now. It should work if it's being fed by the combined, the simple cycle, or it should work based on being fed by the battery. Um, but yes, there would probably have to be some kind of further analysis to see, are we putting these things in the right place? Hi, this is Lisa. Oh, Lisa, I can hear Hi. you. <laughs> Thank you for the star six instruction. Okay. Um, I just figured I'd chime in here since one of my comments was about this storage issue. Um, when <clears throat> Ken Dulski brought it up before, the the idea that came up in my mind was that um, the uh, possibility of encouraging storage might be linked to those peaking units um, that are the higher emitters, um, basically to allow their continued operation because they might be needed. Um, Maybe there could be a separate standard or separate requirement away from this pound per megawatt hour standard that would um, tie in the, uh, to, to the extent that the standalone pound per megawatt hour rate of the unit is above a certain line that um, you then have to have a certain amount of compensating storage to to help um, <clears throat> basically eliminate the need for that unit coming on at various times. Um, and I mean, this is all off the top of my head, but um, I think it would need to be separate from this you know, the renewable portion of this pound per megawatt hour standard. I, th- I um, think, oh, go, go ahead, I'm sorry. Now you, now you could add on there. Okay, yeah, I, I think batteries are a separate and distinct animal from renewables, that's, that's a clear statement. Um, I think the thought process or the thought of having these batteries in or near places where the peakers are makes sense. Um, I, you kind of just alluded to that. Um, but how we do this and how we permit it, uh, boy, I want to hear people's ideas. Um, um, the last thing we want is the the dirty uh, peaker to be running off the grid, charging a battery and then putting the battery on the grid. I, that, that doesn't help anybody with anything. Uh, but what we do want to see is is some kind of clean charge uh, or cleaner charge, uh, and then using the charge uh, release at the, at the right time when when the air quality is the is the worst. So um, those are all things to think about. Okay, <clears throat> to go back to my other, um, I really appreciate all the comments that have come up so far, um, especially the idea that we absolutely need a bigger picture to be able to address any of the details here. Um, I I really like the life cycle comments also. Um, It it all comes down to what the numbers are overall and and what the goal is. Um, Like Toby said, we have to know what we're shooting for if we're going to know what that pound per megawatt hour number needs to be. Um, with regard to that number and the idea that it occasionally needs to be changed, I believe that it needs to be very fluid. I mean, we should be looking at that number as a dial so that um, you're able to respond to situations where there is 
um, where there's too much CO2 being emitted and it's obvious that something could be done by the generators. Um, if for some reason we have a technological advance that all of a sudden makes it more possible for EGUs to do something, then you ratchet that number back and ask everybody to participate. Um, so to a certain extent, uh, talking about the absolute tons versus rates, um, if you use this rate wisely enough and, and ratchet it back as you need to, um, it will, to a certain extent, um, control the tons. And I think that point's been made too. And along with Reggie also, I think those two things do address tons. And of course, you also have to keep going back to the big picture to see what else needs to be done where. Um, a couple detail things. Um, the initial calculations, they were talking exclusively about new, gener new renewable generation. And that triggered alarm bells in my mind. Um, and without seeing all the details, it's hard to comment on this, but if uh, it seems like a lot of people have, have invested in renewable energy through time, and it would seem that that somehow needs to be incorporated into this overall plan. Um, all of this, I, I, I can guess how, where this is coming from. It sounds very much like the old arguments about anyway tons. Um, but I think that a, a baseline taking into consideration all available renewable generation when you are considering these pound per megawatt rates um, would be the best way to proceed. The number will be much lower if you consider existing renewables as opposed to only new renewables. Um, but I think it's a much, it would be a much fairer approach um, to where people have invested in these renewables previously. Um, and the only other thing about the, uh, the formulas and the allocations, um, I'm not sure if I understand it exactly right, but I would not want to see a situation where allocation, all allocations were going exclusively through DEP. Um, it seems to me like this needs to be a rather fluid um, process where generators contract associations with renewable resources and apply them you know, link them to their units and that that could change through time depending on, you know, what's happening. And I don't know, I, I don't know what your vision is for the allocation process. I mean, maybe DEP would have to be somewhat of a part in this, especially if there are renewable sources that don't want to make their own contracts or whatever. But um, Lisa, can I, I, can I interrupt sure. for just a second on that thought? Um, sure. I'm going to go back to my land use days and and cringe when I say this. Uh, but are you thinking something similar to the mitigation bank in land use where, uh, you know, someone would build uh, 50 acres of wetlands and, and then different people could use that to offset various projects? Um, I'm not familiar with those land use regulations, but it sounds like that's what I'm talking about. Yes. Okay. Okay. So you, so someone builds new renewable, a uh, 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 hundred megawatts of renewable, and and they parse it out to whoever needs it as needed. That that's what you're suggesting. Right, and that all of that gets um, assigned somewhere. I mean, there needs to be an accounting, certainly. Um, and my first thought goes to, um, you know, the Camby system where we all put in our, our NOx emissions um, and there are, uh, I'm thinking about allowances going back and forth basically. Um, but I think all of that, that uh, the assignments and the allocations could all be done on some kind of um, system. And, and like I said, it could be changeable depending on, on how things change through time. Okay. Well, you had a lot there. Um, I, I think uh, why only new renewable? Uh, it's not fair maybe to those that have already invested. Uh, maybe consider a renewable bank. Uh, need big picture uh, life cycle analysis you agreed with. Um, 
I liked your analogy on the need to look at it as a dial. I'm not sure how to phrase that one uh, in a rule, but I but I, I, I see where you're going with that. Um, you know, one, one of the things I have to highlight, and, and I probably should say this at the beginning of every session, um, I we have we have a rule schedule where we want to get something done and we want to get it in the books uh, uh, and, and something useful that's going to be meaningful in the short term. Complexity of rulemaking, a complexity of what we're doing makes the rule harder to get done in a timely manner. Not to say we won't do something, but uh, the more complex the rule, the harder harder it is to get done and the longer it'll take to get done. I'm not trying to make excuses. I'm just explaining I want to get something done that's tangible and real. Uh, so uh, the, it's, it, all these ideas are great, and I hope we can do a good amount of them and address a good amount of them. Uh, but we, we have to keep it within the realm of something that we can get done in a timely fashion. So um, there is another comment. Uh, uh, Jeff, OK, it's, I think we've can, talked can about Can I this. interrupt you real quick? Who, who is that? Is that Hannah? Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca, I'm sorry. Ken, I just want to do a time check because we are scheduled for a lunch break at 11.30. OK. It's about 11.05 now. And it might be good if Heidi could put up the last slide so people know where they can write their comments. Thank you. Rebecca, it sounds like you're in a stadium over the loudspeakers. OK, um, as Rebecca said, uh, we will be accepting comments, and I alluded to that uh, throughout our discussions. Um, if you have anything written uh, or electronically ideal, ideally, uh, submit it uh, through this web, web address. Um, we will be posting all comments online. We will be sharing everything with everybody. Um, make sure you put in the header of the email njpact.egu uh, colon egus. Um, as I said, we have vault, multiple pieces of rulemaking going on. We want to make sure you get the right comments to the right people. So we have about 24 minutes left based on the time check. I'm glad we've had a very robust discussion, a good back and forth. Um, Jeff, you put a comment in. The goal needs to be 45% reduction in CO2 in the 2030 based uh ipcc cc report um okay so regardless if it's 30 or 40 or 50 these are all aggressive goals they're all something that's going to dictate we have to do something yesterday um and this is kind of the the kickoff of of really getting something done with the egus um New Jersey as a whole, compared to other states, has a very clean fleet to begin with. Um, proud to say that, uh, you know, my predecessors in the permitting program have done a stellar job in, in, in pushing technology and pushing controls. Um, uh, NOx emissions are low uh, in a comparative sense, VOCs, the, every, everything, uh, SO2 is non-existent compared to some other states. Um, but we still have work to do. Um, and we really have never tackled CO2 in a systematic way. This is new to us. Um, it's new to you. Um, you know, I am thrilled that companies are having discussions about batteries. I'm thrilled discussions uh, are going on about, uh, uh, you know, these solar projects uh, maybe getting divvied out across multiple uh, uh, facilities. Um, these are all things that are going to have to get followed up, up on. Um, I'm going to uh, I, I, I'm going to give one last chance for anybody else who has something to say. There's I think we've gone through all the comments in the comment section and no one has their hand raised at the moment. Um, but uh, this has been to me a very productive meeting. Um, and again, I, I apologize for the delay between round one of this meeting and round two, but circumstances well beyond our control uh, uh, delayed this. I, I would have hoped for this a, at a much sooner date. So, uh, but your feedback from round one is what drove this round two. Does anybody have any other comments or suggestions? Heidi, if you could put the schedule back up.
So we're, we're going to take a break here at this point, but I do want to share the schedule for the balance of the day. Um, I think at 1230 we're going to get restarted um, and we're going to have a, a discussion on um, fuel types um, and, and lowering fuel intensity standards uh, by evaluating different fuels and, and uh, what their standards. And then after that's done, we're going to get into uh, electrifying boiler fleets um, and, and individual boilers. While she's trying to do that, I. OK, uh, so if you look at the schedule at 1230, as I said, we'll get back into it. Um, and uh, uh, we should finish up by four o'clock. Um, Ken Dolsky, I see I would summarize my feedback as the tool to reduce pound per megawatt hours as is too broad and the focus on stacks is too narrow. Um, I would summarize. My... Ken, can you can you explain what you mean there? I, I, I'm not following. Uh, I'm sorry. I was just saying that the one tool that you identified, which is reducing whatever, whatever if I have the, the units right, uh, the pounds per megawatt hour. I think it's it's overly broad. You need to look at more specific details, especially on peakers, and, and look at other technologies that could be used with a totally different, uh, you know, approach rather than focusing on on just you know that that kind of measurement. And when you focus only on stacks, um, and you say CO two is the total issue, as Matt said previously. If you're looking to reduce greenhouse gases, the, the place to look first is the ones is the greenhouse gases with the greatest global warming power measures like, like you know, like methane and, and, and others. And I realize, you know, you're stuck kind of, you know, forced into looking at it in these um, actually, you know, stovepipe or stacks or silos, because that's the way you look at these things. But, um, you know, you really need to look at it in different horizontal ways as opposed to just your vertical vertical look at these different technologies. All right. Thank you. I mean, across the BPU, I mean, or, or okay. across DEP. Uh, no, I, I understand it. And and the whole life cycle is also a, a, a piece of that too. Uh, looking upstream in addition to thinking turn turning it sideways. I I, I got it now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Heidi, you want to say something? You have your hand up. You may need to unmute yourself, Heidi. OK, um. If there's oh, let me just sorry, what do you need? Uh, you had your hand up. Oh, not on purpose. <laughs> OK. OK, I thought there was maybe something you wanted to highlight with logistics. OK, um, so we are going to reconvene at 1230 and uh, we will jump into the discussion about uh, reducing highly uh, carbon intense fuels. Um, and then we will uh, have another discussion at 145 uh, getting into the boilers and reducing emissions in the building sector. Um, and don't forget, uh, each one of these stakeholder sessions needs a separate response. Uh, so you, you, if you responded to this one and you're, you're thrilled with the way it's going, make sure you sign up for the uh, mobile ones also. Um, we really need everyone's feedback on, on all these issues. So, oh, Barb, you got a, one question in at the, la at the very end here. Okay, so I just, it's maybe I missed part of the first, the beginning of this, but I want to hear a little bit more about the kind of modeling that you plan to do to answer some of these questions so that you can really know in a more granular way what is actually happening to emissions in the state. Um, so can you say more about who would be doing that and what does, and, and this has to do with leakage within PJM? Yeah, I, we did talk about that earlier, and and there was not a really definitive answer. I'll be honest. We said uh, the modeling, if if it's needed and when it's needed, if it uh, would be done in conjunction with BPU, um, and with our uh, sister uh, energy uh, and uh, and clean energy office. So, um, and and there was a, even a request uh, to share some of the assumptions and the modeling results. Uh, if we did that uh, prior to any rulemaking. 
So uh, just keep in mind again, uh, and, and I say this, uh, modeling takes time and I'm supposed to have a rule done. So uh, there's a balancing act here of how much detail I can get into uh, versus getting getting a rule done. So I, I there's a balancing act. Mike uh, Eggington, go ahead. Hey Ken, just a, a logistical question. Can we stay logged on uh, until we start up again at 1230 or do we have to re-log on? It is the same link. Hypothetically, you could stay logged on. Um, I'm going to log off myself because um, I don't know what happens uh, after a long period of time, but uh, you can stay logged on or you, you can re-log in. It doesn't matter. Okay, um, thank you. Frank, did you want to say something before we uh, close it out? It's actually a, a, a similar to Michael's question. Um, will we continue to record this as one recording or are you going to stop the recording and restart it? We're going to stop the recording once I close out and then we're going to restart the recording uh, at, at 1230. Thanks, Ken. All right, thank you everybody. Uh, your uh, input is greatly appreciated and I hope uh, most of you will uh, join us for the 1230 session. Um, much appreciated. Thank you. And before I turn off the recording, yes, John, the slides will be made available on the uh, PACT website once once we're done. So Rebecca, you, or you could stop the recording at this point. Thank you. Thank you.